Good evening and welcome to the uh, April 26, 2003 planning board meeting of Wapakon Township. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. Uh, and at this time, I would invite you to join us in the uh, silent moment of prayer and the oath of the, followed immediately by the oath of allegiance to the flag of our country. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'm required to state that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided indicating the time and place of the meeting in accordance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975 by advertising a notice in the Star Gazette and the Express Times and by posting a copy on the bulletin board in the municipal building. Beth, at this point uh, in our business tonight, we are swearing in a new member of the planning board. Mr. Hartman, Mr. if you please just stand and raise your right hand, and I'm just going to administer the oath. And do you, Kermit Hartman, so, uh, solemnly swear firm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of New Jersey, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and to the governments established in the United States and in this state, under the authority of the people, and that you will faithfully, impartially, and justly perform all the duties of a member of the Wapakon Township Planning Board according to the best of your ability. Yes, I will. And congratulations, you are sworn. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Herman, welcome aboard. Thank you. Beth, may I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, members Coyle, DeLeo, Hartman? Here. Polito? Here. Weeks? Here. Mayor Mangucci? Vice Chairman Sampson? Here. Chairman Van Lee? Here. We have a quorum. We do. We do. All right, our first order of uh, old business uh, will be approval of the minutes of the March 22nd, 2023 uh, minutes of that meeting. Uh, has everyone received a copy of uh, those minutes? Yes. Are there any questions, comments? No. Hearing none, those minutes will stand as approved. That's right. Okay, moving on the, in old business, we have the cubes. Block 102, lots 9.01 and 9.03. This is the redevelopment plan. This is for preliminary and final major site plan hearing. Is the applicant here? Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Christopher Costa. I'm the attorney for the applicant. I'm from the law firm of Stevens and Lee. Um, we are, I'm representing the cubes at US 22 sub one. We're here tonight seeking preliminary and final site plan approval for the construction of a warehouse on the property that's known as the Phillipsburg Mall. The current mall building and the proposed warehouse crosses over the border of Lopak Hong and Pohak Hong. In Lopak Hong, the property line is, um, <clears throat> the property that is the topic of this application in Lopat is Block 102, Lot 9.01 and Lot 9.03. Uh, for context, 9.01 is the main mall property and 9.03 is the friendliest property. Um, <clears throat> Pohak Hong, for reference, is block one, lot 1.01. Uh, we are proposing a warehouse of 833,258 square feet. Uh, we submitted a concept plan that slightly adjusted the warehouse size about 10 days ago, um, and it didn't change the Lopak Kong size at all. It changed the Pohak Kong size slightly. It reduced it about 15,000 square feet 
The reason for that is we provided some screening next to the Kohl's department store, which will remain on the property. So there's there was a the original plan that we submitted was about 848,000 square feet. It's now down to 833,000 square feet. Um, the portion that is in Low Pat Kong is 428,258 square feet. Um, <clears throat> the property is located in the Low Pat Kong Township Redevelopment Plan Area B. The redevelopment plan that controls the use and bulk standards for the property was adopted by the Town Council on October 5th, 2022. Uh, procedurally, 3.4.7 of that plan required concept review approval, approval by the Town Council before this application proceeded to the Planning Board for this preliminary preliminary and final site plan review. That approval was granted by the council on February 1st, 2023. My client- Was it February 1st? Yes, I have that, it's February 1st, 2023. Thank you, council. Sure. Um, the CUBES complies with all of the standards of the redevelopment plan, except for one bulk standard and three design standards. Our engineer and our planner will address these in their testimony. Um, several of the features of the property and the immediately surrounding properties we think make my client's proposal uniquely suited for this site. First off, it's already a developed site. It's fully paved. It is a um, out-of-business mall at this point, um, and we're actually reducing the amount of impervious coverage on the site. It's also very close to route, it's right on Route 22 and has close access to Route 78. So any um, traffic from the property will stay on the major highways and will go will be less likely to go on the smaller roads. Um, also the entrance that uh, was made for the mall originally from Route 22 accommodates the um, actually reduced traffic flow uh, from this uh, new use of a warehouse in its current configuration. So we don't need to change the configuration of the Route 22 entrance. We are changing some of the timing, which our traffic engineer will address some of the timing of the signals, um, but the actual entrance is able to stay the same. Um, and although we are changing or improving, I should say, some of the circulation roads within the mall, um, the mall basically has an external loop and an internal loop, and that very nicely serves the uses on the property so that the external use can stay mainly dedicated to some of the residential uses um, that are on one side of the property and also the quick serve restaurants that are on the front of the property, whereas the inner loop can be dedicated to the warehouse use. I also wanted to note to the board and the public some of the uh, other features of the property that have impacted how we've proceeded with this application. Um, I mentioned one, which is that it's located in two townships. Um, so we have two cooperating townships that have redevelopment plans. They are not the same redevelopment plans, and it's not one board that we're uh, appearing in front of. So we submitted one plan to both townships, and you'll note if you look at the zoning charts on the second page of the plans, you'll see that we covered both townships and the redevelopment um, ordinances in that chart. So we have one plan that's gone to both townships, but each township has slightly different standards. Um, so that's one unique aspect. Another unique aspect is that the Coles department store is remaining on the property. So this property will have a warehouse and it will have also the existing retail use. Um, that Coles was connected, or I guess still is connected to the existing mall. Um, that will no longer be connected and there'll be a dry aisle and now some buffering in between the Coles use and um, the warehouse use. Um, <clears throat> this is, as I said, caused minor changes in the plans recently in that we provided Kohl's additional um, screening. Um, the property also has and services, uh, I shouldn't say has because it's not actually on the property, there are separate lots in front of the property between us and Route 22 that have quick serve restaurants. So the traffic that comes into the mall will pass by the quick serve restaurants and we've addressed how that can happen most efficiently. But those quick serve restaurants are different ownerships and they will remain on the property. Um, and the final unique aspect of this property is that behind the property, uh, there is another site that is part of a redevelopment zone. In this township, it's part of the same redevelopment zone. 
in Poet Kong, it's part of a, a different redevelopment zone, but um, that is the site, site to the west of the property, and um, <clears throat> it's uh, Block 102, Lot 9. That property has also been slated for redevelopment, and one of the per potential uses is a warehouse um, on that property. Um, and that property is under separate ownership. No application has been filed before this board for the development of this prop that property. So that property is not before this board at this point. However, as part of our process of creating the plans, um, we provided access points to that property um, on both sides of the existing mall property. So there's, you, you'll see when our engineer goes to the plans that there's two, two ways to get back to that property if and when they develop that property in the future. So that, that has been addressed in these plans and the specifics regarding those access points and any changes, um, if any were necessary, would be addressed when that application comes before this board. Um, so that's a different project, but we, we basically, it's almost like we did utility cutoff points for that project in terms of the roads. Um, we have um, <clears throat> four witnesses this evening. We have our um, engineer, Daniel Reeves, uh, from Bowler Engineering. We have John Harder from Atlantic Traffic Consultants to address traffic concerns. Um, we have Frank Pecunis from CRG. CRG is one of the owners of the Cube, so he is the representative of the owner. And we have uh, John McDonough, our professional planner. So with that, I would uh, like to introduce our first witness. Uh, before I do that, um, we just confirmation, we've provided our notice and copies of it. Um, I have original copies, which I can, I can hand you a packet of, uh, but I believe the notice is in order for this, this hearing. Um, and with that, I'll introduce Mr. Reeves and we can swear him in. If you could just raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this for is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and split your last for the record. Sure. Daniel Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S, from Bowler Engineering. Thank you, sir. And where would you like Mr. Reeves to set up? That's not this case. Probably in front of this map, there's a well, there's microphone the microphone there for him. So you yeah, we're trying to, to get, trying to get somewhere near under this. So maybe if you go on this side. You can find by the club. Um, do you want to swear him in for did I, did I just miss a swearing? We did. Okay, you just I need apologize. To I was working on the logistics. Um, Dan, can you give us uh, the back the benefit of your educational background, your licensing, and um, your experience before land use boards in New Jersey? Certainly. Good evening, everybody. I have a bachelor's of science in civil engineering from West Virginia University. I'm also a licensed New Jersey professional engineer uh, since since 2016. And I have uh, been in front of uh, more than a dozen planning and zoning boards throughout the state of New Jersey. Okay. I would ask that um, Mr. Reeves be accepted as an expert in professional engineering by the sports. You so so. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everybody. As, as, as you heard from Mr. Costa, the property is known as 1200 Route 22. And uh, the site is, is subdivided by a township boundary line between Pohacon and Lopacon. The total area of the site uh, is 74.22 acres, of which 34.9 acres is within Lopacon. The site is located in a redevelopment area for both townships, uh, where a warehouse is a permitted use. What we have here is a current aerial exhibit 
with a with a date of February 1st, 2023. I don't believe this was presented to the board with the market. I'm, I'll mark that A1. <clears throat> and what this aerial is showing is, again, is a picture of existing conditions for our subject lots, lot 102, lot 9.01, as well as lots lot 9.03 here in here in and 9.04 in Mopaca. Uh, with respect to some of the surrounding uses, to the north we have the Sycamore Landing residential apartments. To the east we have multiple quick service restaurants, including the Friendlies in Mopaca, Taco Bell, and Starbucks, Chick Fil A, and Panera along the Route 22 frontage. To the south there is an additional residential neighborhood in Pohaka, and then to the west. But splits both Pohacon and Lopacon is an existing farm field that is a proposed future development of a warehouse use. With respect to some of the existing conditions on the property itself, as you can see, this is formerly known as the Phillipsburg Mall, as you heard before. In red is the outline of the Phillipsburg Mall. There are portions of the mall that have been already demoed. This area here is to the north as well as to the east, as you can see the concrete, uh, the slab that is currently exposed. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, or also known as the northeast corner, is in the existing friendlies that is currently vacant, as that is proposed to be demolished as part of this application. With respect to access along Route 22, there are multiple access points for, for the subject property, one along the north, north there is, there is a multiple movements in the center, as well as one along the south. You'll hear more about the circulation and access points from our traffic engineer a little bit later tonight. What I, would, what I do want to note as some key uh, characteristics of this site is the existing uh, loop road that surrounds the, the mall. As part of this application, you'll see on, on a future plan I'll present later, this loop road will mostly remain as is today, providing access completely around the proposed development. With respect to what's going to remain, as I mentioned, what's shown in red is the proposed mall that will be demolished as part of this application. However, on the <coughs> south side of this, there is an existing coals that is, that is proposed to remain as part of this. There are also parking fields north and south around the development, as well as two existing detention basins that are in desperate need of repair that have not been maintained throughout the years. So as part of that, we are proposing a new stormwater system that I'll further explain a little bit. To get a little basis of the topography on the site, which is, which is key to some of the cross sections that I'll later present, for everyone's reference, on the north side of the site on Route 22 is approximately <laughs> elevation 300. To the south is approximately elevation 350. So there's approximately 50 feet of, of topography relief across the whole entire front. In the middle, it's about well balanced at around elevation 330. With respect to some of the uh, other conditions on existing conditions, there are there is approximately 2,900 parking spaces, including the poles on the property, and then of which 1,354 spaces are located in Lopacon itself. The, the key component uh, to this is that we will be reducing impervious coverage, as you heard from Mr. Costa, as part of this development. Uh, so it's a key component that we wanted to reference as the site is mostly fully impervious today. The mall takes up approximately 572,000 square feet on the site, and the existing friendlies in Lopacon takes, takes up approximately 4,000 square feet. If I can then now go to our colorized rendering. You could, when you when you pull it up, just read the, the date absolutely for the record. This is an this is an an overall site layout plan with a date of April thirteenth, twenty twenty three. And what this is, and then I'm going to label this A two. What this is is uh, our latest, our latest plan that was submitted to the board. Again, as as Mr. Acosta already mentioned, there was some changes based upon the original submission to where we accounted for an additional buffer in Pohacon for the existing goals. 
Besides that, everything else remains generally as is, is what has been previously submitted. What we did was we, we colorized the, the site plan, edited aerial background for the properties that we are not disturbing, as well as enhanced it with our landscape that is shown on our landscape plan. So you could help see the beautiful coloring and buffering that we are proposing here today. The key thing that I wanted to mention first is about the circulation of the proposed site. Or let, let, me, let me back up. What we're here for, as you heard, is for an 833,258 proposed warehouse development, of which 456,528 square feet alone is in Lopaca. The remaining, of course, is in Pohaka. With that, access to the site has been really designed extensively and coordinated both with your board professionals as well as uh, POHACON's professionals. And this was to enhance the site and to eliminate the commingling of the existing QSR properties as well as the coals to the proposed warehouse use. So what you'll see here is the, a green shading and red shading as well as a yellow shading in this internal loop road. Basically, as you'll hear from our traffic engineer a little bit later today, our, the full intention of this design is to keep all warehouse driven traffic and demand in this inner loop road that's highlighted here in yellow. The loop road fully circulates the proposed warehouse, so therefore impacts to the outer loop road will be minimized to the greatest extent possible. The areas in green will be for passenger vehicles only, and this again will not be for the warehouse, this will be for the, for the out parcels. And then the areas in red are the areas where they will commingle. This is only in the areas where the entrance and the exits are proposed for the, for the site. So as you can see, very minimal impact to the outer loop road as part of the proposed development. One thing also to note is the outer loop road, especially along the northern side of the property line in, in Lopatcon, is in the same general location where it is currently today. Other, some other key components with respect to, with respect to the building is the building fully complies with all bulk criteria except the side yard setback. I'll explain that a little bit further. As part of the redevelopment plan, there is a requirement that the building be set back 275 feet from this side yard setback. We are proposing in the top left hand corner here, 242 feet. Based on the angle of the building and the property line, however, the average setback distance measured from the corners in the midpoint is actually 276 feet. So it is, a, it is a key note to add is that majority of the building is compliant when you look at the average setback across the, the side yard, the side facade. Now, again, this was mentioned in the board's professional planner's letter, but just to get that in a little context, only 1% of the proposed building is within that, that setback as, as requested. And then another key note to add is the existing mall prior to that to the northern end being demolished was 239 feet. So that is even closer to the residential property line as we are as we are proposing here today. Additional building uh, bulk stat is that the proposed building height is allowed to be 60 feet in height. We are only proposing 50 as part of the most recent design and the building from the mall is actually is actually 40 feet further away from the road and you'll see this in the future uh, cross cross section I'll provide so basically for in context for the board the, the building facade is set back 40 feet further to the plan south than where the mall is currently today I think um then we're just to clarify that then where the Bonton building Thank you. was yeah yes <clears throat> I will now pull open uh, pull up the the architectural renderings and floor plans for everyone's viewing pleasure. Okay, so this is architectural rendering the cubes at Phillipsburg, and it is a 12 6 2022 date, and we'll make this a 30. I believe all of these were submitted to the. To they the, all absolutely. Okay, because there are, I will be quickly showing the floor plan as well. <clears throat> so as you can see here, this is a, a colorized rendering of the 
of the proposed warehouse development. Uh, we've been, the architect has worked with the, the board's professionals as well as continue to work through uh, if, this, if this application is deemed uh, approved tonight that to meet the colors and variations throughout the building to make the most attractive warehouse building design possible. <coughs> what I do want to, I'll flip to the, the general floor plan here. All right. So we'll mark that as A4. Thank you. Again, this was all submitted as part to the to the board prior to this uh, hearing. And what, what I wanted to certainly identify is really the locations for the office so that we can demonstrate where they are with respect to the parking areas. There, there's two proposed office locations, both in the front corners of the building. These will be accessed by the proposed parking areas that will further show. But this, the, as you can see here, the, the warehouse is still showing 848,000. As part of this application is approved tonight, we, the plans will be updated to reflect the the revised building uh, building square footage as presented here tonight. Before I move over to this, I do want to note one architectural layout here is this is a cross loading dock building to where there will be loading on both sides. You'll you'll see on the when I bring back up A2 the amount of loading docks and where the locations are today. Or proposed, excuse me. For the record, bringing back up A2. With respect to the parking for the proposed warehouse, the total warehouse parking for the entire development is 405 spaces. And looking at Lopacon specifically, there is, there is a requirement of one space per 2,500 square feet of gross floor area. Working backwards from the new 833,000 square foot building, that gets you to a required amount of 334 spaces approximately. Again, so we are fully compliant with the 405. Now, those 405 spaces are, are strategically located adjacent to both offices. So there are parking areas both in Lopacon and Pohacon, of which 106 are in, are in Lopacon here on the north side of the building, and the remaining 299 are on the south side of the, of the building. With that, there are access aisles for these parking areas, uh, of which in low pack on, there is a requirement for a 30-foot fire lane. Our drive aisle here proposed in this northern area is only 24 feet. However, that is typical for a, a passenger vehicle, so we are requesting relief this evening for this fire zone requirement, as well as with that, there's a requirement that there is no parking in between the fire zone and the building. Again, we are seeking relief from that this evening. Is that um, request for relief further mitigated by the fact that the inner loop road is located just outside of this parking aisle so that that would give an additional fire access on both sides of the building? That's correct, yes. And so fire access can be made fully around the building based on that inner loop road. <clears throat> Loading, as I mentioned before, there there are uh, approximately, uh, ex there, are, there are 79 loading docks on the north side of the building, and there are 80 loading docks on the south side of the building, as well as a fully compliant truck court width of 75 feet immediately adjacent to these loading docks. And then we are also proposing 90 trailer spaces on the north side, and then of which 100 trailer spaces on the south side, both crossing the, munif the municipal boundary line between Lopacon and Pohacon. And those are just trailer spaces. That is not the truck cab, correct? That is correct. For, for loading requirements based on the zone, of which 400, of the 456,000 square feet in Lopacon, one loading, one loading space is required for every 30,000 square feet. Based off of that, 15 are required. We are fully compliant by providing 85 on the left side of the building in Lopacon itself. Another key component of this design that I wanted to certainly highlight for the board is the extensive landscaping buffer that we are providing as part of this, as part of this inner loop road system. So in between the inner and outer loop roads is, this, is the 50-foot required 
buffer area. In that, there is a there is a earth burn as well as an eight foot high privacy fence that will be that will be also installed. We are seeking one minor deviation from that, as in this area immediately pl planned plan south to the west of the existing Taco Bell. There is approximately 85 feet of this of this existing. I'm sorry, of the proposed area here that we are reducing that down to 40 feet. This is for the inclusion of an additional lane that our traffic consultant will further further explain. But again, it's only a very small percentage of the buffer where it's only 85 feet of the entire uh, proposed buffer here. And does that area also include the berm and the uh, fence as a mitigating factor to the the lessening of the width of the berm to 40 feet? Yes. In general, for the board's understanding, the, the buffer and the fence will continue around the entire, the enti all three sides of the proposed warehouse development. <clears throat> the vegetation within that buffer is, is, is proposed to be 8 to 10 feet at planting height. And then as mentioned, there is also an 8 foot high, on top of the earth burn, 8 foot high privacy fence to help shield the, any screening of the proposed warehouse use. Another key thing that I'd like to note for the board with respect to the view shed from Route 22, not only do we have this, the buffer area, but the existing quick service restaurants provide a unique buffering screening from the warehouse as well. Driving, driving down Route 22, you'll, you'll mostly see a lot of the quick service restaurants along the frontage as well as their landscaping. And then beyond that will be, will be the proposed buffer that we have. So the view shed of the warehouse will be very minimal. And I'll further further show that in some of the cross sections that we prepared for tonight. <clears throat> One other landscaping uh, I'd like to note is there is a we are seeking relief for the basin, the basin area along to lot nine in in Lopacon, to where the, we are required to maintain that buffer. We will be working, we'll be happy to work with the township professionals on providing some additional buffering in there, but due to the access road to the proposed basin, this does request some relief here this evening from the board. I will note to that, as I mentioned before, we do think that the that the landscaping proposed here is adequate for the proposed use that's intended for this, since there'll be a similar use of a warehouse development anticipated for that. As mentioned before by Mr. By Mr. Kress, I do want to note to the boards, these are the two legs that that is proposing the connection to the to the western property. Each of these legs are to be to be bought are not critical for this development as they are only providing access to the southern property. There is no use for the proposed development for this. So we I do believe there was a, a comment or two regarding the slope and maybe some of the the lighting and landscaping around these areas. We are seeking relief from the board from this, as this is simply a preliminary design after working with the with with the proposed developers on this. However, not critical for part of this application. Uh, Mr. Rich, can I add two two things um, with the buffering in the rear? The uh, detention basin looks large, significantly uh, larger than 50 feet, but that is not included in the buffering calculation, correct? That is correct. Okay, but it does provide a visual separation, certainly, between this property and the property to the rear. It does. Okay. Yes. Um, the other thing, just to clarify, um, does the apartment complex to the west, yes, northwest of the property, use that um, leg that's on the west of the property? Um, so I'm just, I, I know that those those two points that you referred to um, that would access the property behind them all um, understand that they will not be used because at this point because that property isn't developed. But is the one to the west going to be used uh, for access by the apartment? Yes, the, okay. the, the outer loop road, as shown in here with the, with the green hatch, is again the the same exact location right. as the existing loop road, and will is only intended to be the use for the for the apartment complex immediately to the north of our of our property. Okay, got you. So that, I, I, I was just confused. So the, the, it's really the one on the east side or the south side that is at this point not going to be used at all. Is that Correct. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. 
That is correct. And and with that, the the with respect to the buffer of the proposed basin, um, I will note that we, the everything mimics the existing location of the the existing basins to the greatest extent possible. So therefore, we're not creating any further buffering uh, relief. We're not requesting any further buffering relief than what is currently out there today. And I will note that the, the basin is a significant upgrade from what's out there today as the two the two basins, one in each corner, are, are in desperate need of repair. The basin is attractively landscaped in that area and the use of the basin is similar in nature to the proposed use. I believe there, uh, with respect to some of the lighting, we are proposing all new uh, lighting as part of this development. The lighting will be fully compliant with uh, typical warehouse industrial standards. In fact, we are pr proposing 3000 Kelvin, which is like a soft warm light compared to a much higher 5000 Kelvin, which you might see in, in other developments. This will certainly help reduce some of that light glare and that view. That view. Some of the comments that were received um, from the board's professionals, I would like to note. I believe some of them, with respect to some of the light glare, light glare excuse me, as well as visibility to the light structures, the light fixtures. All the light fixtures within the inner loop road and parking area, the light poles, have all been positioned to throw light and face toward the building. There are wall area lights proposed to light up some of the walkways and the closer parking areas. These will have a louvered house site shield to help minimize that wall wash that was that was rec that was identified potentially in the in the planners report. So we will be happy to uh, mitigate that by proposing house site shields to help uh, minimize that. And then the height of the poles, as well as some of the location of these, have been strategically located to help minimize the actual view of any of these light fixtures. However, I will note that all of the light does not present any light spillage onto the residential proper line except in one location. That location is only in the lower left-hand corner, and that's simply just to light up that outer loop road and provide that connection to the residential property, not any of the lighting for the proposed warehouse use. <clears throat> Then you mentioned the fencing, um, and there was a comment in the um, planner's letter about um, requesting eight-foot fencing throughout. Um, and that's something we've agreed to, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. As part of the, the the buffering and the screening, we are proposing an eight-foot high uh, privacy fence <coughs> that will be on top of the proposed burn along the northern side of the proposed development. Quickly about the stormwater infrastructure, I just want to note that we briefly that we are again enhancing that although although we do not need to meet the green infrastructure requirements because we are reducing the impervious coverage this is a key thing to note as part of this development we are decreasing impervious coverage by a, a significant amount so therefore we are naturally meeting the stormwater management rules requirement however we are proposing a a nice large wet pond in, in compliance with the storm management rules above and beyond what was really necessary to meet the green infrastructure requirements. With respect to the utilities, all the utilities are, are available on the property based upon the existing use. Proposed connections will be will be provided within our disturb within our development area and will not impact any of the existing quick service restaurants that are also using those utility tiles. With respect to some of the agencies, we have received a letter of no interest from the New Jersey DOT as part of this application. Again, our traffic engineer will be happy to explain that a little bit further. Uh, then we've also submitted to Warren County Soil Conservation District, as well as to the Highlands Planning Area, where we have received an exemption number four as part of our as part of our proposed development. I think that concludes my direct testimony, and we can be happy to go through and reiterate some of the comments from the planner and engineering letter. Sure. If um, let me ask you a few things, which I think will address sure. some of those. Um, the trash compactors and recycling plant. If you could just describe where they'll be located on the site. Yes, absolutely. There are there are four green boxes 
shown on the outer edges of the proposed loading docks. These are what we're proposing as, as typical trash compactors for, in, for this type of use. This is pretty standard for a warehouse. These, these trash compactors will certainly be scheduled for private pickup from a private hauler um, and then be able, to, uh, be able to be hauled out by that as part of the proposed development. Okay. And the building will be um, fixed with a um, ESFR sprinkler system, an early suppression fast response system. Is that your understanding? Yes. As typical with the majority of these developments, the building will be set to the latest standard for sprinkler system. Okay. Um, and there was a request for EV charging stations to be installed, which I think was 4% um, or five electric charging spaces. And um, my understanding is that that is something we will agree to as well. We'd be happy to comply, yes. Okay. One thing to note uh, that I'd like to put on the record is I think uh, comment number five in the professional planner, the board planner's report is respect is with uh, about the noise study. As as mentioned with the with the earth berm within the, the buffer screening area, <coughs> that eight foot privacy fence in addition to the on top of that berm does provide the necessary sound attenuation to meet the requirements out along that residential property line. That is that is 50 decibels. And there has been a study that was that has been performed by an acoustic expert, excuse me, acoustic expert, and demonstrated that the proposed use with the with the construction of that berm and fence will meet that requirement, which is certainly a state standard, and the 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 proposed application will meet that based upon that. So I will refer to that report that was provided to the to the board uh, that we are meeting all sound requirements as a part of this proposed development. I think I hit on majority of the, the landscaping comments, I hope, with respect in the planning letter. Law of Lot 9, we happy to comply with adding some additional trees within this buffered area, as well as work with the board planner and board engineering office to supplement some additional deciduous trees rather than the heavy evergreens without this, without this burn. Mentioned the fencing that was proposed, fire suppression and lighting, as well as the electric vehicles and, and recycling plant. With respect to the Collier's letter dated April 21st, I have had the opportunity to speak earlier today to the, to the board engineer, and we take uh, pretty much no exception to complying with a lot of the majority of the comments. Except a few, as mentioned already, we are requesting relief from the from the fire lane um, for note 2.02 .02 in the comment letter, and then as well as uh, we, we do believe that we are meeting the intention of the of the buffer area. So, with respect to 3.03 .03 in the engineering comment letter, we do believe that there is adequate screening and buffering from the proposed warehouse development to the residential property line. 3.05 is in reference to the two driveways, so we are seeking uh, relief or an understanding that the adjacent development does not impact our our proposed development, our proposed application here this evening. And then we'll be able to comply with all stormwater, all stormwater related comments. I will note for the record. Item 3.07 was discussed with the board engineer uh, earlier this afternoon, so we'll be happy to work with them to provide adequate requirements based on the class four GAN requirements, as well as the any geotechnical comments. There was an additional geotechnical report that was prepared after the board documents were submitted, so we will be happy to, come, to submit that to the board's professionals for further review. And based upon that, we do believe majority of the geotechnical comments uh, will be fully fully in compliance, um, as well as if I can close this up. Landscaping and lighting was certainly discussed. Traffic items will be discussed 
a little bit later from the traffic engineer. <coughs> and we are we are we'll be happy to work with the board engineer on some of the additional grading uh, requirements as well as pavement box thicknesses that are referenced in the letter to provide adequate <clears throat> an adequate design for all parking and loading areas uh, for the site. I think that concludes. Happy to take any questions. I have a problem. The fire lane being reduced to uh, 24 feet, I think you said. Or, That's correct. Um, did you check with our fire department to see if they were agreeing with agree that? I don't. We don't have a a letter from them on that. We only had the feedback from the, the engineer. We usually require that any changes to the fire uh, code laws. Uh, if you could get in touch with the fire department, um, he's done it with the other warehouses. We can we do had. that. Yeah, we, we can we'd appreciate the letter fire. indicating that they were satisfied with it. Yep. Okay. I agree. Pardon? I said I agree. Oh, okay. um, and you did say that you're going to, the building will be sprinklered then. That is correct. Okay. Uh, and the only other one I, I had was the parking, the electric chargers. Uh, <coughs> I think the five percent. Five parking spots is referring to passenger cars. That's correct. Uh, what are you doing for electric trucks? I I not I think that would probably be more of a tenant driven tenant driven uh, requirement. I don't believe there is a state requirement for for the for the truck vehicles, but I, we can I can. Um, one of our witnesses is the owner, and he can talk about okay. the demand for that at this point. No problem. Push on to electrify all of our diesel trucks out there. It seems to be on. So. Yep. Okay, thank you. Open up the uh, George. Right. Uh, just for clarity, the, the friendlies. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of this application, the friendlies is going to be taken down, and the area is going to be put in the green space. Yes, and that's that's permanent. That's that's part of this plan, and it won't be available for future sale or anything like that. That's correct. That okay. is correct. Uh, just wanted to make that clear. That's coming down, and will stay open. The other question I had, though, dealt with the access to the rear, and this would be the what the southern driveway to the rear property. Uh, the question I had there, and I understand that it's. It's not part of your application and that type of thing. But the question I had there is that driveway that's proposed is extremely steep for trucks, at least as it's currently sketched on the plan. And the concern I have isn't that it can't be redesigned, but your basins basically lock that design in. At least that's my humble looking at it. And the question I have is, is that if, they, if the tenant in the back if, they, if it ever happens, uh, wants to develop that, is there enough room in there that he can put in proper vertical curves for, for a truck traffic and not destroy your overflows for your basins and make him have to regrade that whole end? That's what concerns me. It's not, I understand what you're saying. It's his problem to work it out. But his problem may turn into your problem if he has to tear basins out that you built. Uh, so anyhow, that's my question. That uh, I would think that that needs a little further study to make sure he doesn't have to take the improvements out that you're putting in for your project. Certainly understandable and can understand your concern. I, I will note that two two things to this. The slope is only tentatively shown based upon what we anticipate the finished floor elevation to be for that proposed use. That tenant, it's still being you know worked, and so depending on where that finished floor is set, the slopes can naturally change to that. So we do not believe that it will negatively change anything with our basin, and that there will be adequate grade to to be able to meet that. To, to be able to get adequate slopes for those driveways. So However, we are showing 
I do believe it is mentioned on average of 10 percent, which you know it is is not something that's not seen even currently on Route Route 22. So we do believe that it is certainly accessible by 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 these larger truck vehicles. However, again, all that can be further designed as part of the, the, that applicant, depending on when they. Well, I, 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 I guess I understand it, but when you get a vertical curve in, so a truck doesn't have to sit on a 10% grade at the intersection, that driveway is going to have to be. I guess all I'm saying is you have your spillways for your retention basins, and it's going between two of them there. There isn't a lot of room, at least I'll, I'll defer to the engineers in the end. Uh, to get everything in there and get that to work without possibly damaging what you're trying to do. Uh, that's my only question. You're comfortable enough that he can get proper vertical curves in there and get an intersection in there and not have to touch your things? Yes, sir. All right. I have a question. Sure. North, northwest upper corner here. Okay. All right. Well, on your building. Okay. Down your building. Okay. All right. You're saying that doesn't meet the, the clearance code. Okay. And can you tell me by how much? And can you tell me why, if you front your building, it still doesn't meet code? And why you feel that it should be so close to a development? Why don't you shrink that side, not the other side? Oh, so, yeah. So, what we're proposing is 242 feet. Where the side yard setback is 275 feet, correct? Right, um, and then as I mentioned in my testimony, majority of the of the building is compliant with that setback. Right. It is just due to the due to the uh, the angle of the property line. When and you again, say majority, what do you what what part of that building do you feel doesn't meet code? With a finger, show me your hand or something. Yeah, so I'd have to scale. NIP, I'm not holding it. Yeah, I'd have to scale it, but it's it's basically probably close to where you're seeing this this dimension. It's only a small little pizza slice, little sl slither that's that's within that 275 foot requirement. Right. And where is the Lopacon property for that warehouse? The the it's municipal boundary. The is municipal boundary line is this really blue line that's yeah, I didn't see that. running through the building. All right, so it goes on an angle. Correct. Okay. And the other question is, is it, is it a, a factory type warehouse or is it a through warehouse? Delivery and pick up and go. I believe, I believe. Yeah, I can have our, our client will answer that question. Yeah. How much flow there is. Yep. Okay. Mr. Chair, yeah. I just wanted to touch on one uh, comment and one, something that the board's keyed in on in the past and I think I mentioned. Uh, I did mention in our letter. Um, just in terms of uh, for the sewer service, I know that we received documentation from the Phillipsburg regarding the availability of sewer capacity for the proposed development. But uh, in the past, the board has requested a confirmation or a letter of capacity and a review letter from the, the uh, township's sewer engineer. Um, so I think that should be something that's considered as a, as a condition of approval or something that the board should consider as part of the application. I think that was a condition of the completeness application there. You would check with uh, LOPAC on to see if they had enough sewer capacity to deal with it. Yes. It's, as, we, a, as we pointed out at the completeness hearing, we, we have it's been in litigation for 30 years. so. We, we have submitted well served letters um, to, and I believe based on our conversation earlier today, I believe this was one is needed for the local here engineer that we will be happy to submit that and, and coordinate that. But we have gotten a well served request, I believe, from the sewage authority that has demonstrated that, as well as I will note for the record, based upon the proposed use and the existing use, we are significantly reducing the proposed sewer demand. Just based on the use of this, as the existing mall is certainly a higher sewer demand than what our proposed warehouse use would be. So we certainly do not feel that there would be uh, any issues with re with respect to the, the lower sewer demand request here. Okay. We have always considered this as the existing owner of the sells the property does not have the power or the authority to transfer his sewer capacity Mm -hmm. when he chooses, it comes back to the township right. for allocation from that point. 
We'll be happy to comply. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just following up on that, is the sewer affluent going out on the POHAD side? It is, yes. I believe I believe there is a uh, ultimately on site and then ultimately goes down Bliss Boulevard into POHAD God. And I just have another quick follow up, and it may actually be more appropriate for council, but um, it concerns the access to the rear property. I know that you do show it on there. Is there going to be some type of cross easement? Yes, we are. Um, really final with agreement on the cross easement but for signing it you know we've got that we've been going back and forth or you know it's probably the, the been the easiest part of this project in terms of all that the pieces involved so we we've got that that yeah, squared I just don't away want to landlock a property, so if no and i am happy to um you know i think that's been a condition all along i'm happy okay. to provide that to you perfect thank you and i'll just put it as a condition yep. compliance. that's fine i have a couple questions <clears throat> what is the uh, what is the ele the elevation of the top of the structure of the warehouse? The proposed height of the of the warehouse will be 50 feet. Do we need a variance for that? No, no. S 60 feet is is what's required within the redevelopment plan. So you don't have an elevation, right? Because you said you don't know what your finished floor is going to be yet. Oh, no, we certainly do. I believe the finished floor is tentatively, I think, proposed on the plans to be elevation 332. And just then, just to clarify, I think um, where we don't know the elevation is on the property that's undeveloped in the rear, because um, that's not that's not our property and it's not okay. developed at that point. That's why he was talking about the, not was, knowing the elevation. That was only for the driveway slopes, because right. depending on where the finished floor is set, that's going to set this development area for the slopes on these two driveway connections. Our finished floor is certainly set as shown on our plans. Okay, so your finished floor is 332. Mm -hmm. So that means the top of the structure is 382. Do you know what the top of the coals is? I don't know off, off the top of my head, no. What about the top of your berm? Do you know that elevation? Sure. <laughs> I think the, actually, I think the board engineer might have referenced those elevations here. Mr. Reeves, did you mention you had a cross section? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's Thanks. Yep. That would probably help. Yep. yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's where we're getting at. Here. Sure. All right. We Going up to A5? Yes, A5. A4 was the fourth. Okay. You want, can we do the whole package as it? It's a three sheet set. Um, so something? we've got uh, three sheets of cross section. Can we do it as one? Yes. A5. It's three sheets. Um, okay. If you could just read in the Yes, absolutely. Basics. So this is entitled cross section exhibit. And uh, with a date of April 24th of 2023. Again, it's a three sheet set that I'll quickly flip through here. Uh, this is an overall key map showing section where section A and where section B is taken from. And you'll see they'll be strategically located uh, from the view shed of the, of the two of the existing apartment buildings here. I'll flip over to. <clears throat> As you'll be able to see here, section section AA, which again, everyone's reference, is the one closer to the, to the middle, close to the middle of the building here. What you're seeing here is the height of the existing apartment building. We have our existing outer loop road here with the existing vegetative buffer in between our property, our proposed berm and solid fence here with the inner loop road, some additional plantings in between there, our parking area, and then our proposed building structure. So uh, to, to correct for the record, our finished floor is at set at 332.25 with a top of building elevation at 381.75, currently shown in this, in this, in this exhibit. And what you'll, what you'll see here, if I can get the board's attention to, is this line of sight from the second story of the apartment building is showing that the entire view shed 
of the building it will be blocked by the proposed berm and fence as shown here in between the outer loop road and the inner loop road. And then also note for section BB, which is just, again, a little bit further closer to Route 22, where you'll have a similar, you'll have a similar view shed to where the existing berm, I'm sorry, the proposed berm and fence with, along with the existing deciduous vegetation in between the properties does block the view of the building. So therefore, uh, with even with the 50 foot high building, the proposed berm is is doing its job of blocking the view shed from the from the apartment residential complex. And let me just stay on that for a few moments. The the one on the bottom was was it BB that you called it? Yes. Yeah, that is. Um, show us where that is on the first. Sure. Is that the one that's closer to the road? That is correct. Okay. Yes. So that's the, that's the area where we are seeking the waiver of the the size of the buffer. Um, so if you can go back to that sheet, because I think we've yeah, there's a couple of mitigating factors. Um, one is it appears that the apartment complex is at a significantly lower grade. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. There's there's also existing vegetation, which we've then supplemented by the wall and a berm. And then we further supplemented by it looks like two separate rows of um, yes there are there are there are two separate rows that will be staggered uh, to provide that that buffer okay <laughs> and then just for clarification the, the planting heights that are currently shown are those at time of construction or in five years or ten years of maturity correct this this is shown at, at time of at, at the time of planting, which is the eight to ten feet. feet, and then as, as you know, as as some may be aware, most of these evergreens grow at minimum at least a foot a year. So as 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 everything grows in more, even more of the view shed will be blocked. And then uh, based upon one of the uh, I believe one of the board members' comment, this is the the setback uh, here, so you can see which portion of the building is 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 within. The, with that setback. Again, it is it is a triangular shape. However, when you look at the average, it, we do meet that. So I just wanted to note that for, for the record, as well as we did provide a cross section. This is section CC, and section CC is taken from Route 22, and based upon the topography of Route 22. To, to the site, you can see that Route 22 is significantly lower, approximately 30 feet lower from the finished floor. And therefore, in addition with this, with this extensive buffer that we're providing, again, view of the building will be blocked in this, in this portion in Lopagon of the building based upon the, uh, the proposed buffering with the evergreens as well as the proposed fence. Again, you can see the, the line of sight to the top of the building. I have a question. Sure. And, and, and I ask every time every warehouse, I don't feel that pines do a good enough job after like 15 years. Okay. They all grow up, meaning the, the, the branches grow up. So now you've got a lower view that goes through. What is the plan to stop that? Okay. The pines are growing. You know what I mean? They're dying off in the lower branches. So we never introduce any other bushes. Should be some years lower. Yes, and I'm asking. And, well, there's, the landscape architect yeah, as well. there's, there's also an eight foot fence that's going to right. be behind most of this. And if I understand correctly, since this fence is going to act as a noise barrier also, it's going to be an absolute solid, solid fence. fence. That's and correct. there won't be any gaps in it, anything like that, or it won't act as a noise barrier. That's correct. And there's also shrubbery in these designs. That's it, it, was, there is shrubbery. I was, I was going to note that. The, the trees are your larger circles here scattered throughout. Majority of this of this buffer is of your of your I would say shrubs that will grow up to that right. to that lower height, and then the evergreens and deciduous trees will be scattered about to get the right. higher canopies. Yeah, your extra six feet once the branches die off. That's what you got to close up. Yeah, it'll be a you got create it. that full so straight fence. Correct. Yeah. And so we think that's a sufficient buffer for the uh, residential area that's right next to it. I think I think they made a, a very good attempt at, at it, and with the earthen berm and the eight foot high wall, uh, I think it's going to be a very effective screen on the residential side. And they will have 
I assume their noise person is going to testify as to the effectiveness of the wall because the combination of uh, the plant material and the wall is really to keep the noise down as well. It's also intended to cut off all the low headlights so that at night you're just not seeing uh, just a scanning of the area with the trucks as they come and go from the loading areas. And the applicant is carrying the Birmingham wall all the way around so that when the commercial side of this, when you're in the restaurants and that stuff, you just won't be looking at a bunch of headlights and that stuff sitting at loading docks. They'll, they'll actually be looking into a landscape Berman wall. And then the, at best, you'll see the tops of some of the truck boxes. But all the lights and that stuff will be confined to the warehouse section. So I think they've made a pretty good effort at it. I have concerns with what's going on in the back, and we can talk about that later with some landscaping. But I think the perimeter, the 22 side and the residential side, I think they've covered quite well. The other side, <clears throat> I guess that would be the, um, the east side of the property, the coal side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess we don't have drawers. We don't have drawers, yeah. Can I ask what the fence is? What kind of fence you put on? We're, we're proposing, right now, we're just proposing an eight-foot high privacy fence. Final fence? Most likely okay. not. Okay. Most, board, well, board most likely not. Board, I think. Most likely it'd be wood. Yeah, we do use it yeah. 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 Board. It, it's going to have, a, the, the fencing isn't on your plans yet, just to make it clear. Uh, they haven't submitted any fencing, but the fencing is going to be solid, and it has to be massive enough right. to get a Correct. ten ten. Your your noise guy indicated to get a ten dB drop across the fence. That's correct. So it's going to have to be fairly heavy duty. It's got to be an inch thick, as what his yeah, report said. Yeah, it can't said, be so. chain can't length with plastic liners put in. That kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And yeah. to that point, we will certainly have to meet the state noise requirements, and we plan to do so. Right. Is there any proposal for a concrete panel type uh, noise wall? No, not not currently. Okay. Only for the the earth berm and the eight foot fence, as uh, as demonstrated in that in that sound report. Yeah, we found in other projects that the the you know the board on board wooden fence, you know that's I think it's approximately an inch thick, is it solves the noise issues. Any other questions for Mr. Reeves? He will, he will be uh, here. So. Well, I, I, I don't know if this is the right time, but the one place that I do think we need to think a little bit more about some landscaping is, is what would be the you know, south, western side of the building. And that's the area behind the detention basin before it drops down to lot nine. And my concern back there is that we get some additional landscaping the way the back is designed is that most of the plant material is located, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, it's located around the perimeter of the wet pond. And that is some, if I looked at the grades right, it's six to 10 feet lower than the top of the berm. So that when that's first planted, there won't be anything that's screening the backside of that building. And what I'm concerned about is at night, since you're sitting on the top of that hill, uh, for all the residential people, primarily in Pohatcock, this building is going to be really standing out on the crest of a hill. And what I'd like to do is get some landscaping in there so that we get some height. It doesn't have to be a wall, because I don't think that'll be all that effective, but to get some trees and landscaping along that edge uh, to begin to try to pull the building down a little bit. We, we can we, we have to work with you. We have to work with you on that. And just on the Pohat, two people have talked about that. Uh, we were in Pohat two nights ago, yes. and there was some required planting along this way. So it's okay. answered one inquiry. Anyway. Well, that that's fine because that that was my main concern is that that backside is pretty open as right. it as it's currently being proposed. Well, since they're indicating that Pohat coming is authorizing along the. <laughs> Continue that down across the back side, you know. She's having a hard time. I didn't catch the beginning of that. Do you want to say it again? It says Pohat has um, 
authorized or required you to landscape down along that pink road if you could just kind of angle it under either back towards the uh, low pat line and come across there with whatever you're, you're doing there while you're doing it um, if you would be amenable for that we, we can do that and we'll work with we'll work with, with your planner on that I understand that, you know, that, that slope is pretty uh, steep back there. And what concerns me is not so much as the road being a 10% grade, the trucks pulling up there at 1 o'clock in the morning could generate a lot of noise to be pulling a grade that way. And also the jake breaking, if that is going to be a downward entrance into the adjoining property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Food for is that what we have 10 percent from the from the front of the property to the back is so that what we have no for that's property. for the the driveways here that connects to the to and the then if you property. drop down to the property behind their property you have right. easily a 10 percent grade yeah, if, you, if you're going to go so you're pretty flat off. coming off of 22 mm -hmm. to the back of the property it's just past your retention basin where it's going to drop yeah. off the, yeah, uh, the existing mall is generally it undulates but it's generally the same elevation elevation yeah. throughout yeah the actual the that spur of driveway that for the future development in the in the impact mall is approximately six to seven percent and the other spur that goes along the south side of the wet pond is ten percent so and then just to speak to the landscaping around the wet pond you know that that's required per DEP's uh, BMP Correct. manual. Mm -hmm. So if you have a wet pond, you're required to plant it with native materials around 80% of its perimeter. That's primarily to cut down. The intention there is to improve water quality, but also to cut down on the amount of geese and like birds that come in there. So if you have a heavily vegetated border, they're less likely to go and try to nest around. There. So we have an ordinance in town that's no greater than five percent. I believe is what it is. I think I had it referenced in the report, actually. So would they need relief for that, or is that the next guy's problem? That's really going to be the next guy's that's problem. Kind of, that's what we're requesting. Because the, the actual plan that was submitted, you know, this is showing a future condition. The plan that was submitted does not include those driveways being constructed at this time. So if this warehouse is approved and constructed, those driveway spurs will not be built until such a time that a plan is presented to the board boards in Pohakong and Lopakong to approve a warehouse in the rear. So you know, at that time, and actually that 10% spur is in Pohakong. So Correct. technically, you know, we're voicing concern and it might be an issue, but I guess technically plus the ordinance in Pohakong would sort of control that slope. So the driveway in Lopakong is actually compliant currently as presented. That particular driveway, though, in Lopat, mm -hmm. that connects into the apartment complex. No, it does okay. You can't Back see it, there. and I think Mr. Reeves explained that. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell. You see like a really dark line, the dark mm -hmm. line that runs between the yellow road. There's another road that's hatched green, I guess, which got, somebody got camouflaged yep, this in the right grass here. area. That's the access to Sycamore Landing. Correct. Yeah, and again, the, the green is just identifying the passenger vehicles only. And uh, this is the. So it's on the, right here, it's on the, the outer outer side of the berm. Correct. So the dark green is the berm with the wall uh, that we keep referring to. So the, the access to the Sycamore Landing is going to sort of drops down behind the berm and runs right into the, the complex. Line. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Reeves? Sure, you're aware that that driveway is in the deed restriction for that property there. Oh yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've read the deeds. Yep. No, I, yes, I am aware of that. Thank you. And we didn't go through. I'm mean, sorry, just to speak to that. We didn't go through line by line in our report. I don't think there's a need to. But we did have uh, one of the recommended conditions that we have is that upon approval, um, you know, the applicant's engineer and surveyor would have to prepare an updated easement plan that would identify any minor revisions or changes to these existing utility and access easements that sort of encompass the entire existing mall site. So that would also cover that access to Sycamore Landing. 
for questions only. All right, at this point, I'll open the for this questions only to uh, this expert um, to the public. Yes, ma'am, would you come forward, please? State your name and your address. Um, Robin George, 34 Raleigh Court. And I actually am going to ask two different sets of questions, Beth. One is a resident. So I'm asking resident-based questions right now. Um, so uh, let's see. EV chargers, um, I assume that you're meeting the new state regulation requirement for a new development? Okay, good. And um, will a percentage of those be ADA accessible? Yes, as stated in the code. Okay, um, thank you. Um, the building rendering that you showed is really, actually, it's pretty, it's brown. It's not that ugly cement brown, gray. Are we going to put that into the requirement that, are you going to promise us that you're going to make it pretty and have different colors and not be that ugly gray that we see everywhere? I'm sure that the architect, <laughs> the, the final design will work with whatever okay. the are set for in the, in the ordinance. Okay, because we see a lot of gray warehouses and seeing a different color is unique and inspiring. I didn't know there was such a thing. So that was interesting. Um, have you considered, I know that you said previously that like there was access from 22 that was designated for cars only. There already is. That first entrance heading eastbound says no trucks. And the residents have over and over again commented on, well, the truck drivers don't follow directions. Have we considered a reward and punishment system for the truck drivers? to ensure that they actually follow directions. You know, I one time I drove into the Burger King parking lot pulling a horse trailer, and I was punished because it was too tall. Um, is there such a thing that we can consider to ensure that truck drivers get punished? Yes, it swings out of the way that far, but it is a punishment system to ensure that they might make the mistake once, but they won't make it twice. Um, that's a punishment. A reward is they don't get banged when they go in the right way. So just a you know a, a you know carrot and a stick kind of way to encourage them to follow directions. We have a traffic engineer that's going to be testifying okay. shortly, so I think these questions probably are directed more oh, to that okay. than uh, it is to this engine, this uh, expert. Perfect. Sorry. Sorry. Didn't Don't mean to. You. No. <laughs> okay. I will, I will note. I will note quickly is that I mentioned this earlier that truck traffic. There will be potential trucks on that outer loop road adjacent, mm -hmm. to, the, adjacent to the quick service restaurants mm -hmm. to service those for delivery and loading, mm -hmm. but not for our proposed rate. Yeah, I was thinking more in terms of the, the first yeah, entrance yeah. that says, you know, no trucks. Right now it says no truck entrance. Um, I'll, I'll let our Yeah, that, that's fine. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to okay. ask the wrong person. And the last thing is you talked about recycling and um, trash compactors. Um, having just done street cleanup for the second year in a row, um, is there going to be adequate garbage receptacles for the truck drivers so that they can put the dreaded pee bottles in that and not on the road? So that they can put their fast food bags into the garbage receptacles. How many receptacles are you planning around the facility? And will there be, can, is there such a thing as a receptacle that's a truck driver height so that they can put it out their window into a truck receptacle to minimize the garbage that's put on the streets. So you don't have to answer, I'm throwing it out there. It's you know something to please contemplate as you're as you're preparing for presenting to your final submission. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to just ask two questions as the Shade Tree Commissioner, if I may. Okay. Uh, no? This is a little bit out of here. Uh, it's, it's, it's just about the trees. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, you've already asked the similar questions. I'm just going to ask two more in relation, if that's okay? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think you're talking about the existing tree line between the residents and, and the, the property. Are you planning on removing all of those trees to build this berm and plant new trees? Because there's a very mature tree line there with probably 100 existing mature trees. The trees outside of the outer loop road will will will, will remain. Okay, okay, because I, I really didn't understand where the the berm was going. Yeah, it showed in that okay. in that section. Those are, those are the existing trees okay. closest to the residential property. Very good. And that's one of the 
benefits of this site is that that outer loop road is already there and what's beyond it yeah. is So the berm is going on the inner, in between, in between, between those. Right. Okay, that's terrific. Um, and then the only other question that I had was, will you be providing us with a planting list of the varietals that you're going to be planting and only to ensure that we're not planting any invasive um, and to Brian's question about diversity of, of species. They've already been submitted as part of the landscape plan. Okay. And, right. uh, I'll review that then. Thank you very much. No right. Thank you. Thank you. Judy Liptak, 47 Kyle Drive. Do you mind standing over there so I can hear you under the microphone? Sure. Thanks. Can you give me your name again? Judy Liptak, Kyle Drive, L-I-P-T-A-K. Can you show me on the um, map there with your finger maybe the outer loop? Because I didn't quite get it. So all the way around, what's that outer loop? Yeah, so the outer loop road is what's shown here in green and red. It's connecting to the to the apartments to the north and then adjacent to the existing quick service restaurants and then back around to the back around to the back and then the and then the to the bottom for the warehouse use. And what's the red? The red is where the the the, the passenger vehicles of the existing quick service and, and coals will interact with the that co mingling that you spoke of? Correct. Right. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks. Um, how do we plan to minimize that co-mingling as much as possible and who would like monitor that or enforce it? Our, our traffic engineer will certainly talk about the circulation and the desired uh, paths for, for entrances and exits. But again, this has been extensively designed and reviewed to, to push all warehouse traffic into the inner loop road immediately. So therefore there is limiting the co-mingling between. So it's by design that it should limit. Correct. Not should not be need for any type of enforcement of it. There, there's also wayfinding signage that will also. That I was going. I was going to ask that. Yeah. Is there signage? Is there also signage along those roads that would be no parking, because trucks tend to enjoy parking at night on roads that they shouldn't be parking on. They, there won't be trucks parking on this site. On the outer, Correct. overnight. Correct. We hope. Um, you chose red. I, I, I enjoyed the rest of the, the design, but red sticks out quite a bit. I wonder how we came up with that color. Doesn't doesn't blend. Red red is red. It was just a pop. That's all. Just for just for just just for. Uh, I could see if you, made, if you made it like a silo and it was supposed to look like a barn, perhaps. But red red is kind of sticks out and kind of defeats the purpose of all the berms and the trees to try to you know, deflect attention from the, the warehouse. So just maybe something oh, to think about. The color of the warehouse. The color of the warehouse. Yeah, I'm talking that one I'm part is red. 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 And we're talking about, you know, sight and don't see it yet. We're going to put red. Red doesn't blend at all. Right? That's just something to think about. So um, these plans are being developed without a tenant. So things could change drastically, including traffic. But I'll wait for the traffic guy to talk about that. Um, so is this warehouse a storage facility or a distribution warehouse? Or you don't know? We're, we will, um, Frank is going to testify next. And okay, that'll be answered later. Yeah. Awesome. So they'll talk about the operating hours because I hope that the developer wants to be good neighbors to the um, people who've lived decades in their houses and now have a warehouse there. So how do you plan on being a good neighbor? And would that be restricting the tenant so we're not 24-7 with trucks and lights? It will be a 24-7 facility. Um, so Unfortunate. The, the, um, that will be the, the timing. However, um, the lights will dim after 10 p.m. Um, and we'll be on sensor at that point. And they'll tell us how many trucks they project, although you don't have a tenant yet. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, so, how will you continue to be good neighbors in that aspect, besides the dimming of the lights? Because I'm not hearing a lot about pollutants. We talked about lights and sound, but we're not talking about trucks idling. So, where there'll be signs that trucks can't idle and pollution spilling out into, again, these two neighborhoods where people have lived for decades and now find a warehouse in their backyard, how are we protecting them from those pollutants? 
One thing, um, I'll let Frank uh, talk about kind of the operations, but one thing that, that is important about this site, and, and it is a worry that a lot of people have about warehouse sites, um, is trucks sitting around on site. And there is trailer storage on site, but there's no truck storage on site. So there's not going to be people overnight on site. There's not going to be people staying there for long periods of time. They're there to drop off and pick up. So, that's so going to be the flow of, of this warehouse. So they don't run when they're they're parked to drop off and pick up. Um, Are let, their engines yeah. off? I'll let I'll let Frank address. Yeah. All right. That'll be answered. Yeah. That will be answered yeah. later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, so that answers the idling signs. We talked about trees and there's going to be a list. So it's going to be a mix of trees. So the coverage isn't just seasonal. It's going to be all year round because, you know, when trees lose their leaves, we can see everything. So the, it's going to be mixed and the height, you know, there'll be bushes, trees, evergreens. That's correct. Right. You spoke about the um, fence being... Um, See how you worded that, so I get it right. Um, on top of the berm. Do you mean literally on top of the berm, or in addition to the berm? A fence in addition to the berm, or it literally will be on top? The, the bottom of the fence will start at the top of the berm, and then and it goes up. And how how high was that berm? It it, it varies depending on depending on the the, the grades along in between the two loops. Right, I get but that. But it's it's generally I believe between five to seven feet and then and then the fence is on top then of the fence correct okay and the trees will be mature trees like we're not bringing in saplings or medium size or like five foot trees we're bringing in yes there, there are requirements for planting heights okay as shown in the planting and then how long do you maintain those trees until they're fully mature and established so they're not dying because we see that with the other warehouses where they definitely are not blocking the warehouse yet and a lot died, so they had to replace them. And I see that there's still more that are dead, and I don't know if they're going to replace them. So what's that long-range plan? Will you maintain that until, like, for years until they're established and they're not, you know, considered new plantings and can dry up and die? Absolutely. The, the applicant is How long? happy to what's, agree to maintaining to provide that buffer con continuously. Forever? For five years? Yes. The buffer has to exist. Per, was it forever? Part, it's part of the approval. Part of the approval. It has to be always has, in 30 years. If the buffer is gone, it has to be replaced. Right. Okay. Perfect. I don't. I don't know all your. Part of the approval. Yeah. What's that? Part of part the of approval. The awesome. Um, and the buffer is in front of the fence, not behind the fence. Correct. It's it, it, it's on both sides. Oh, it's on both sides. Correct. Yeah, maybe okay. pull, you want to pull up that. Um, Elevation, I think it's A5, just so you can, you can get an idea of the, the it, part of the benefit of this plan, we think, is the layers of buffering. So, closest to the Sycamore properties is the you know, the, the existing planting yeah. that we talked about. See that? Outside road. And then we have the berm next. Um, and Which that's, is here? Right. And that's where the fence is, I believe. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep, the fence is just off center here, shown in here. Mm -hmm. And then there's lower shrubs here to help shield this. As well as the higher evergreens and deciduous on the, on the just adjacent right. to, the, to the fence. And then there's another another buffer area. And then there's another one the in between. Car park. Correct. Before the before the car parking lot. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of buffers, lots of trees, lots Correct. to maintain. Um, you said that you had parking for 405 employees. Correct. 405 spaces. Spaces. Mm -hmm. So, is that how many employees is the site? Um, going to have or approve for, and do you have sewer capacity for that many employees? Yeah, we mentioned the sewer capacity would be happy to. Yeah, I didn't hear any of that. Meet, that meet, was meet the request of that, and I believe as part of this application, we identified a maximum total of 400 employees. 400 for, employees for the day, uh, for three shifts. But I'll leave our Frank to speak to that more in the Frank can address that more. But those that that is not going to be 400 people on site at all times. It's it's broken up. You, you're basically sure. dividing that by three with some over Okay. Do we know what the sewer capacity is for employees on that site? We don't know the number of employees that are going to be here at any one time. Uh, but what's our capacity we, for that? We'd have to go to the sewer engineer to find out what, yeah. what they're uh, calculating for 
Uh, and we usually don't get into that kind of calculation. Yeah, there's various calculations depending on, it could be based on office space, based on, could be square feet of, uh, Square feet of warehouse space. I don't have the regulations in front of me. So, what is our space for? Warehouses and, like, is it warehouse employees and office, or is this just office employees? Like, what it's is? It's both. The, four, the 400 figure is total. Okay. Um, and again, you know, there'll be 150 or so most times, maybe up to 200 um, at most, you know, on any given shift. And it would really, the overlap would be between shifts overlap is between shifts and they're exiting and entering through that which way Exit the employees the office locations are in the top left and top right corners of the building so they can come in any way that the center way or are they coming in yeah they'll be there's proposed door locations for the office where are their cars coming in where are they driving in Again, all, all warehouse traffic will be immediately there. directed into the inner loop road, and then they can get into the passenger the passenger mm -hmm. vehicle areas, or the trucks can get into the loading docks via the inner loop road. Okay, that, yeah, that's what I was wondering. If that makes sense. Um, safety plan as far as fire goes. I understand you need to talk to the uh, fire chief. Um, is the developer in any way contributing to the town in um, fire equipment or fire trucks because we have another warehouse and I'm not sure we're prepared should there be a fire. Is the, is the um, developer giving back to the town in any way? I don't know if that's a correct question. For, for him? Yeah. Who would that be to? Probably the owner or the operator. But I can't believe sure. making such an extraction. Yeah, I don't think it's before the, the board. It's yeah, it's such an extraction will be illegal. So. Say again? Such an extraction would be illegal. Extraction would be illegal. Oh, like a pay to play kind of thing. We don't want that. Um, impervious coverage. I know you've reduced it. So, is that all the berms or the green space from the knockdown um, friendlies? Is the um, coverage that you have, the asphalt, is it more porous? Is it newer material so that we're having more? going through instead of laying on and going to your pond. Correct. Impervious. I know, uh, I'm sorry, I know we are meeting the bare minimum. I'm just wondering if you're going above and beyond at all. We're reducing the impervious coverage, which is asphalt, concrete, sidewalk, right. all hardscapes right. as a part of this. Okay. Development. So you reduce that. Again, is that coverage more porous? I know there's different grades of asphalt that you can use. There's newer systems out there that help drain the water so it goes through and not into the there's no there's no porous payment proposed on this on this design there's nothing nothing newfangled environmentally friendly it's just solid there's no proposal there's no porous okay payment. wonderful um i think that's a traffic question buffer um you know how you did the site direction for um you know people living in the apartments and the development there can you show me light like, how is the light reflecting and refracting? How is that going to work? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, all the lights will be facing the building. The building. Except, mm -hmm. except the ones that are on the building, and they will have down house shields, they're called, to point the light straight down. So okay. therefore, there is no spillover on the residential property. Right, you had said all, that. Right. Except in this lower right hand, lower uh -huh. right -hand corner of where the driveway connects. And now you had said lights were going to dim all lights, so it almost would look blacked out. It, or, or is there always going to be a glow? I, I don't believe the outer loop road would be necessarily dim because it would be servicing the residents. But yeah, it's dark now. I, I believe the I believe the, the parking areas would be dim when they're not being used. Okay. Is there going to be um, private security? Because now the mall does have you know, the little security trucks that go around because cameras just aren't enough nowadays. Is there going to be any, because our you know, police, it's a lot on them to add an additional place to have to monitor. So will this site have security? That is a question for Frank who Frank, I got a lot of questions for you. I don't remember them all. <laughs> Frank. Frank. He wants to get up. He wants to talk, but he can't right now. All right. Um, 
Sound report. So the sound report for the fencing, I feel like we still didn't establish what that material is going to be to make sure that it is also, and most importantly, acting as a sound barrier for the poor residents living on both sides or all three sides. Um, an inch thick, I heard you say. Who monitors that? Who does our sound testing? Do we test to make sure they are in compliance? Who does that for us? The question, the question should be directed to the engineer. Oh. Board's not under question. Who does that? <laughs> Who monitors that? Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. That might be something that would be uh, by the by the board's um, engineer professional. But however, we are we will be providing a sound barrier as as identified. In that right. Time. So when you do it, you're just saying, okay, we have the material there, but there's no test that you do to affirm that it's not going over the decibels. We did a test initially, which has been submitted to the board professional. Right. I did and hear that. But after installation, we can do a. a I think that's what I'm asking for. Will another test be conducted so we assure that it's working properly? Yeah. No, no. Yeah, and the, the sounds just to speak to that. Um, the sound the standards for sound uh, at property lines at residential property lines. The ordinance is, is driven by the state statute for, yeah. for noise and by. I DVD. get that. Yeah. So if there are issues mm -hmm. with noise that the township is unable to remedy, that would be something that the DEP would come out and enforce, and they would do sound testing with their own professional equipment. The township itself doesn't have. As far as I'm aware, unless I'm incorrect, that there is no sound testing yeah. equipment that the zoning or code official has. The county, uh, health department. the county health department might, so we wouldn't okay. so engage them. Right. If there's an issue. If raised. there were an issue. But I guess on, it would behoove them to do it ahead of time so that right. there isn't an issue, right? Yeah, based on the acoustical engineering report. Yeah. You know, if, if the, the materials that are submitted are in alignment with the acoustical engineering report, we would rely on that it would perform as intended. Right. If it doesn't, right. then there would be further investigation needed. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so um, I think that's it. I think the rest of my questions are for Frank. I just want to safety plan I talked about, various trees, protecting the citizens, being a good neighbor, traffic, traffic, crime, all good. Frank? Thank you. Anybody else? Any other further questions? Yes, sir. Robert Bruce, 11 Hallwich Road. I didn't catch your last name. I apologize. Bruce, B R U C E. Robert, first name. Um, just a couple of questions I want. Uh, the four or five percent EV space was that a numerical number or was that a percentage number? Four percent, and we will be required. It's a per state requirement. Percent number, and that and that was a state number. <coughs> and the EV space for uh, diesel, I believe, was punted. Like you, there's no requirement yet on the state level. There's no requirement for trucks, but our elect. Uh, okay, the Frank. Other, the speak to very good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the other issue, uh, uh, I just wasn't sure. This kind of ties into what uh, Judy Liptak had, had mentioned about uh, security, um, on-site security. Uh, I believe, Mr. Costa, you had said that there won't be tractor trailers on that uh, red road, that exit exit road for the trucks. When 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 asked about that, you you. you they won't be parked there. How, how do you, how do you ensure that, sir? Is it not wide enough for them to do that? Because I, I, forgive me, I, I try to be calm and respectful. Um, we have problems throughout Lopacon with tractor trailers parking where they're not supposed to be. So take it as a given. They will attempt that. What is? How can you definitively say that? And how can you uh, be proactive in in ensuring? That that either doesn't happen or some sort of enforcement activity is, is taken against them. The any part of the site that's controlled by the client, um, they can control whether there are, are trucks parked there. So maybe but, they'll take that as part of their yeah. obligation. 
by, by, by what means? The on-site security driving around? Yes. Okay, and, and they will have the authority to, uh, to rouse those trucks because we had an issue with that at the local Walmart where uh, the local Walmart security did not rouse the trucks. Instead, they made a, uh, an announcement throughout the store for them to move their trucks. Uh, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that as, uh, as, as your testimony. And um, uh, the other issue, I believe this is the last for you, Mr. Reeves. Um, the issue of the trees, uh, I think uh, 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 Robin, uh, as a resident and as a, a tree commission uh, uh, member, if not uh, head, uh, had some good questions. Um, and uh, she, she raised one of them, which was the idea of eight foot planting of mature trees and how that uh, one foot per year growth doesn't really help when, when there are trees that are dying that have been planted. Um, is, and maybe this is a question for Frank, uh, whether or not there will be a concerted effort to, uh, to liaison with the Lopacon Township uh, uh, Shade Tree Commission, Commissioner so as to ensure that uh, not only is that maintained, but also that, that the, the company that is hired is, is doing a, a, a good job because obviously the company that was hired for the current warehouse, the only sole warehouse right now on Strikers Road, did a slipshod job. And that's why we had the issue of dead trees. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Our, just to answer that, our liaison will be with the township and this board and the obligations that um, if approved will be put in the resolution. Those obligations will continue and the township will, I assume, consult with the Shade Tree Commission as to replace it. So our direct, direct okay. contact will be with the council. Okay. All right. So, so she will be uh, uh, an intermediary liaison. All right. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Thank you. Mr. Bruce, just to speak to your concerns and the other uh, members of the public that mentioned uh, maintenance of plantings. Uh, typically, these types of applications, really any site plan application, requires a two year maintenance guarantee that the developer uh, posts with the township. That after two years, uh, our office typically visits the site, reviews the plantings, and after two years, if any trees uh, are in poor health, declining health, or dead, they will be, have to be replaced before that bond is re re uh, returned to the developer. Okay. So there is there is further follow-up immediately following construction before the certificate of occupancy is issued. And then two years after construction, once the op warehouse is operational. And then again, this approval goes with this use until it gets demolished, like the mall is going to be demolished. So um, if in 10 years, you know, and we've done this on, on bank sites where there was some buffering to some residential areas, and a zoning issue, a zoning violation was issued, and the buffering had to be replaced. So that's going to be a continuing obligation of the, of the property owner. Thank you. And I, one other issue that wasn't raised: solar on the roof of the of the building. Uh, there is no state requirement for solar on the roof of buildings. That's correct. It, 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 anecdotally, I believe that it is though buildings are built so as to be able to have that. Correct, and this one will be. There will be solar on there. They will be built to. Will be built to, but and and, and uh, uh, I don't know again if this is Frank the owner as to. Uh, I'm presuming there's not going to be solar. And At this point, solar. there's not a plan for solar. One of the challenges the with solar on the roof of New Jersey is that, that they can only serve a business there as opposed to go out to the grid. Right, and the challenge with the warehouse is it uses very little energy. Um, so. Although it's great space, until they change the law to allow the energy to go out to the grid, it's just not a very feasible um, operation. Whereas Pennsylvania, for example, allows it to go more out to the grid. So it's just a yeah, you know, it's a consideration. They're built that way for that purpose, so that they can be retrofitted at a future date um, to do that. Assume, hoping that the law will. will okay, and, and again, since it's Mr. Reeves, uh, that's actually getting a question. Then yeah. thank you for answering on his behalf. Has it been your experience? I think you said you did 12 projects. Have any of them put solar on the roof? I think we're getting a little far off the mark of what he was testifying to. So, okay. We're ending it. Okay. Thank you.
Ms. Reeves, is it your understanding that under New Jersey state law, about 40% of the roof has to be solar ready, but that's the only requirement for a warehouse? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, you want to take a break? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've had a request for a break for 10 minute uh, break. If okay. You like. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next witness is Frank Kunis. He is uh, one of the principals at CRG. Um, so I'll, I'll bring. I want you to be on. Sir, if you just raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this for is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and spell your last for the record. First name Frank. Last name P E T K U N A S. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Frank, I, 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 had, I flagged a number of questions. Um, the first was on the type of warehouse. Well, let me start with this. Can you give your position at CRG and its relationship to the Cubes? Let's start with that. Uh, Senior Vice President, uh, partner with CRG, Northeast Region of the United States. And what was the second part of that? Your, the, the relationship between CRG and the applicant. Okay, the applicant consists of two companies, CRG as a general partner, a limited partner, Clarion Partners, big institutional investment firm that runs um, asset management services for pension funds um, and life insurance companies. Okay. Um, there was a question from the board on what type of warehouse this would be. Okay, so we build these buildings on a speculative basis, meaning we don't know who the tenants are going to be. What we do know, however, are the common characteristics that all of our tenants utilize when they, when they move into a building of ours. The design that you see behind Chris is a result of basically the aggregation of knowing all of those things. So what we do is we build a rank, rectangle, we put dock doors on both sides, and we hope that one of our tenants that are in one of our other buildings likes this building enough to come and lease it for us. So although we don't know who the tenant's going to be, we know the types of tenants that will move into this building. So 99 times out of 100, they are warehouse slash distribution type buildings. The one time out of 100, and somebody asked, asked if it would be manufacturing or warehouse or warehousing and distribution, the one time out of 100 is when that manufacturing use comes by and says, you know what, we love it as is, we're not going to use anything in the parking lot, we're going to do everything within four walls, and as long as we're compliant with local laws, we'll manufacture widgets in your building. Okay, so. The vast majority is uh, some type of distribution center. That's correct. Um, and uh, there's a question about um, security. How would well, how would security work? At it? Well, it, it, it's private property, right? So I, I liken you know a building like this much like we all would to our own houses. If something's going on on in our own yards, we self police. So our tenants are. 99 times out of 100 Fortune 100 companies. They're big companies, good credit. They have to be legitimate. They have to have a great balance sheet. They have to be reputable to move into a building of this size and magnitude. So you can imagine if company ABC moves into a building like this and they see something happening on the grounds, like people parking, like people um, uh, you know, sleeping on the site or abandoning trash, it's immediately taken care of, not only by them, but as a requirement in the lease that they cut with us. So basically, they're obligated to maintain the inside of the property. 50% of the time, we as landlords maintain the outside of the property as well as policing. The other half of the time, they will do everything. So it's a double whammy. And I guess you mentioned that you know, these Fortune 100 companies would have strict requirements in their lease as to the maintenance of the property. Typically, these properties, you know, the construction of these properties would be supported by some sort of a loan. I assume the lender would also have covenants. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, there's covenants upon covenants. If, uh, everything that we have in the documents, when a lender loans on a particular building, there are obligations for us to, to maintain the property, uh, to maintain the value of the property, to maintain the condition of the property, to make sure that there are no hazardous material leaks on site. The, 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 the requirements cast upon us as an entity to build a building like this basically makes us behave. And um, electric trucks, you're in, you're in the, the warehousing business. Um, where, where does that stand in terms of when the likelihood of that being a reality? You know, I don't, I don't see it. You know, we like to build things compatible, right? You know, solar came up, and yes, we're going to build the building to sometime, someday accept solar panels if need be. So we're going to plan for it. We're going to plan for um, 
the provision of EV chargers for cars, you know, as far as trucks, we don't see a demand for it right now, right? And we could mention 30 different components where someone would say, you know what, I think this is coming next year. But if it's not demanded by our tenants, we're not necessarily going to build it on a speculative basis. Now, if a tenant comes by and says, look, we love the building, however, we want you to do X, Y, and Z, and Z includes the provision of EV charges for trucks, we're certainly going to do it after we make the proper applications to the board. Um, and there was a question about, um, you answered solar, um, trash, we've got the four compactors. I assume there will be other trash receptacles on the site for the use of people coming on and off the site. Yeah, and that's basically tenant specific. Every tenant has a different operation, right? They know where their people congregate. They know where they're going to have the cafeteria, the break room. They're going to know where the heavy traffic areas are. So even though we have property managers that oversee what our tenants do on site, tenants basically maintain their own policing of, of trash with the appropriate locations and, and amount of receptacles throughout the site. Do you have an idea of, uh, you know, trailers are dropped on and off the site. Do you have an idea of how long typically a truck driver is remains on the site? Uh, Ten minutes. So if you look at the cross dock fit configuration of this particular building, in a very simple explanation, one side of the building, you can imagine... There's 80 dock doors, let's say, on the upper, on, on the top uh, side of the building, in that truck, top truck court. Imagine that out of the 80 dock doors, 40 of them have trailers without cockpits on them. And what happens during the night is those are loaded, right? They're loaded all night long with different, different goods that are going out to stores or different locations. When someone pulls in with a, with a, with a um, load of cargo, they usually pull to the opposite side of the building, drop the trailer for unloading, pull around the other side of the building, grab the trailer, and go. And if, they're, and if they don't have um, a pickup scheduled, and if there's no dock doors available, that's why we put the trailer spaces, the, the trailer um, storage spaces adjacent to the dock doors. So very, very small amount of time. Um, I think I covered the questions that I heard. If there's more questions from the board. And it's a professional. I don't think so. I, I have one. I have one. Not saying he's wrong, but I work in one of those bases. And it's about an hour by the time you drop off, go see your people, come back, go figure out where your trailer is, hook up to your trailer, test your trailer, and go. Okay. Okay? That's just my opinion. It's not a, I'm not an expert. I am nobody in that fact. <laughs> but I did work there. So so you're saying an hour. An hour to me is still very palatable. It's it's a lot different than what a lot of people may expect. Now, it it's very quick. Yeah. But but I, I'll, let me also add that the truck is not running the whole time. Right. Exactly. I think, the, I think the question was really in the context of how long is this truck going to be sitting on the site idling? Not long. Yeah. Okay. So it's really idling when it's working. <clears throat> yeah. If it's sitting for any reason, it's sitting and it's off. There's a law that says it can't idle for more than 15 minutes. Anyway. Yeah. That's right. a New Jersey law. And may I add, that's, that's also the backstop of a lot of what we do, right? Full compliance of all federal, state, municipal laws, all right? We can't, we can't break laws. Okay. Um, and <coughs> no other questions from the board? I, I just want to give you a point of order. I think that you have to comply with the redevelopment plan. I know there was some testimony about manufacturing. George, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but well, they'll be back if they're going to manufacture. That may be right. a use variance. But oh, right, 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 right. I mean, that's another that's another permit in every other time. That that one percent is going elsewhere unless, <laughs> unless there's a. Use you know, I might might I add that a good majority of the time we get inquiries from people that want to lease our buildings, and the answer is unequivocally no. Right? You know that the town won't allow it, we won't allow it. Right? So the use has to be right, compliant with laws. Okay. Okay, that completes yeah, his testimony. That's all unless the public has any questions for Mr. Yeah, Mr. absolutely. Person in the back. Donna Schneider, 26 Meadowview Drive. Um, I just, uh, regarding the trucks coming in and out, I, I get the 10 minutes to an hour of start to finish. I guess what the issue is, what we find in this township is they're not actually hanging out and and sleeping and parking 
at the warehouse site, they're parking everywhere else in the township. And there are no truck stops. So we find trucks parked everywhere. Um, what that that's the problem with warehouses that come in like this. So how do you how are you going we can't, to we can't. exactly the simple, answer, the simple answer is we can't we can't police what we don't own. We can't police what someone does 20 miles down the road. We can very stringently police what we have on this particular site. And what I'm telling you, these buildings are not cheap. They're very expensive to build and therefore they have very high rents. The type of tenants that come into our buildings are very reputable. We don't have 20 people that are doing nefarious things within the building and it doesn't draw that type of driver. Okay, so what we have for Strikers Road is the United <coughs> States Post Office and we have more issues with that warehouse of trash, pee bottles, truckers wandering the roads, truckers parked where they shouldn't be. Um, I know, but I, I don't know if I want to go on record and criticize <laughs> the way the United States Post Office runs. I won't do that. I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm making you aware you're talking about Fortune 100 companies. We're right. talking about the United States government and they vastly can different, do that. Vastly different, vastly yeah. different. One is, one is vastly more yeah, efficient exactly. and mindful than the other. Yeah, yeah, we know that for sure. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, I, I guess my point is it doesn't matter whether you're a Fortune 100, a Fortune 500, the United States government, or some uh, Joe Schmo who opened up a warehouse. Um, it doesn't matter. It's still the same issue. Garbage, pee bottles, idling trucks all over the township, dr truckers wandering the roads in the middle of the night, because I've seen that too. Um, it's turning our township into a dangerous place. and. This is what happens when we invite warehouses into our townships. So um, that I just want to kind of dispute that that's you can't control everything that is going on with those trucks. And they're going to be idling and parking all over those food um, places as well. No, they won't. No, we're going to control everything within the property. So when they stop to get um, Taco Bell and they sit there for six hours, how are you going to manage they're not that? They're going to be able to pull into that parking lot. They're not going to be able to make those turns via those radii. You think so? Because yeah, there was a Starbucks. So it's physically impossible. The star I, I followed a Starbucks. I followed a truck. I was turning into the mall from 22, making a left. There was a truck on my right side, also making a left. He came in, decided, oh, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go and get some food. So he did. And he, he almost smacked into a bunch of cars mm -hmm. because he didn't realize that he can't make, a, he had to stay right. And we're he went to the he went to the restaurants. Yeah, so we're be he able did to it. Happens within our within our the confines of our property. We but it's not impossible because he did. He stopped and got food. So um, it, it it happens. It happens just like you say. You could put signs up. It happens. They they go all different directions, and it's a danger because you're mixing residents with tractor trailers. So um, yeah, it's. I guess it's not. You, my question is basically answered. You can't control any of that, so um, that's where I. That's what I need. To Thank you. Uh, Robert Bruce, 11 Hallwich Road. I was going to say this to the traffic engineer, but Donna brought this up about that incident because I was aware of that incident. Uh, we're, we're primarily concerned about, at least I am, she was, I think most people are, about that uh, entrance uh, on 22 westbound, where there's two left turn lanes that enter the mall. Here. Yeah, that's 22 westbound, and then there's the two entrance lanes. Okay. Uh, and, and that is the point where the trucker was on 22 westbound in the rightmost of the two left turn lanes and having proceeded across 22 and is now in the mall roadway proper he decided he was going to make a left yeah well i'm, I'm going to get too much into the technicalities because we do have a traffic engineer here but i do know that we're making an extra lane there there'll right. be an so, extra lane be an extra lane here which right. will be to for the so on 22, there's an extra lane as well? No. 
right here into this in, under the site, the entrance to the site. So two lanes enter from 22, and where is that third lane okay, going let's, to be? Let's defer this question so the traffic engineer can really answer it the way it should be. Okay. Judy Liptak, Child Drive. I think you answered a lot of questions for Frank already. Um, but I'm still unclear about uh, security. Will you have private <coughs> security on site? Either, yeah, either on or. the outside and the inside? Yeah, the, a good majority of the time, well, it's definitely security inside, right? I mean, I don't have to tell you, you have to you know, watch the news every night and see what kind of theft is going on worldwide. Yes. These guys are very concerned about inventory. They're definitely, without a doubt, is internal security. Externally, sometimes a tenant will come by and say, hey, look, we want a guard shack. You know, we'd like a guard shack, I don't know, here to monitor everybody coming into our parking lot to make sure who's coming and who's going is all legit. So that happens a good majority of the time with physical um, aspects, fences, gate, you know, guard checks, things of that nature to really um, monitor those security and patrols. So tenants always patrol the property. Okay. That's tenants, not you guys as the owners. We don't, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you give me an example of some of your Fortune 500 companies that are in your yeah. facility? Home, Home Depot, Williams Sonoma, Lowe's, Best Buy. Um, the gamut. In this area? Oh, in this area? Mm -hmm. We only have one building in this area, and it's smart warehousing. 450,000 square feet by Airport Road. Okay. So that's, that's not all we have in this area. And who's that tenant? Smart warehousing. They smart warehousing. Smart oh, warehousing. is the tenant? What's that? Is the tenant of that warehouse? What are they? Smart warehousing is the name of the tenant. Right, well, that's what, what I said. What, what do they do? No, just <laughs> I know what Williams and does. Storage and delivery for other other tenants. <laughs> oh, right. for so, other tenants. Yeah, so that particular building has um, uh, PPE, you know, protective yep. uh, equipment for mm -hmm. medical supplies, gowns and masks. So is it a lot of trips, a lot of distributions? Yeah. Okay. So, Frank, remember I said about being good neighbors? Mm -hmm. You can tell we don't want you here, right? No offense, <laughs> but we don't want you here. Um, so how can you be a good neighbor? Because you see our frustration, and you heard Donna, about trucks don't follow the rules. They're just not good rule followers. Yeah. And I know some things are out of your control, but some things are in your control. Um, safety for me is a big one. Um, I, I can tell you countless stories every day, the infractions safety-wise with trucks I entail, I encounter every day in this town. So that entrance and exit you are putting people who are, are who are going to these restaurants and coals. You're mixing them coming in, correct? We're minimizing the mixing by the design of the site. Okay, right? which we'll hear from. That's, yeah. You're about that a little bit okay. more, right? So I guess my point is, you do have some control because that's the control, right? You can you, you can help to minimize the dangers that are ahead of us. You know, the, the best way to minimize and well, proactive design. Right, good yeah. design. That's what we've done here, right? We've basically taken a use, an idle blighted use, mm -hmm. and we didn't try to expand it. We tried to stay within the confines of those parameters and say, hey, look, let's not get crazy here. Let's build something within the scope of that old development. Let's build something new. Let's generate more tax rateables. So being a good neighbor, generating more tax rateables, right? Being a good neighbor, designing something that is not more cumbersome than the previous use, right? Number three, being proactive with our thought process, putting up perimeter boundaries, put up, putting up buffers, putting up screening. So the design and basically being a good neighbor, that's all inclusive. I appreciate that. I appreciate your um, design and um, the berms and the you know site. That's very much appreciated. I mean, if we have to have you as a neighbor, that's a, that's a good neighbor as far as the site goes. Um, that design. Um, so when it comes to going out, where I see that red and green over there, right? Is that the same entrance that is or exit that's right there, where it's a yield onto 22? Are you talking about the, the south end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're talking about entrance and exit. What, what's the question? 
is so it the same? Is it gonna stay the same, meaning yes. just the yield? Yes. Yes. Correct. So you're aware then when you cross over, I mean when you come out of there, right? So in order for a truck now to go the other way on twenty two. To go this way. Yeah. So now they have to go through all the lanes of that highway when they're yielding 22 to get into the turning lane, which now they're going to block everybody. Because oh, you're going to talk about that? That's a traffic question. Yeah. Yeah. I want to remind everybody but at this point. It's going to go with my control. You can control that, Frank. No, we can't. No. Well, you can fix the entrance and exit to make no, them as safe as possible. As part of our design, again, we want to really create yes. a design that was the least amount of impact. And, and my dictate to the design crew was leave the ingress and egress at the same points, work with what you have. Okay. All right. I wrote your name next to things, Frank. Um, although I think he answered most of them. You brought up taxes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, are you? Um, I know some of our warehouses have special tax breaks, so they don't taxes don't go to the schools or pilot. What is your tax structure? I don't, I don't think it's determined yet, right? It's not determined yet. But I mean, even with pilot structures. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a fair question. He's the owner. We weren't discussing taxes here. We were uh, discussing. But he's Frank. He's supposed to answer all the. I think it's done here. Um, well, he brought it up. <laughs> you brought it up. All right. In all fairness, he did bring it up. He did but bring it up. I mean, I'm being scolded again. It is not a factor that weighs on this board. So gotcha. You are both right. <laughs> okay. Frank, that's all. Thank you very much. All right, at this point, I'd like to remind everybody that the board's policy is that we close the hearing at 10 o'clock. So be mindful of that and what you want to accomplish. <coughs> All right. I definitely want to accomplish some more. Um, I'd like to introduce our traffic engineer, uh, John Harder, from Atlantic Traffic Consultants. Is it possible I could probably? Absolutely. Um, Cause I, there wouldn't be a, a mic in the, yeah, no, okay. there at that table. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Harder, before you start and before council starts questioning, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and spell your last for the record. John Harder, H-A-R-T-E-R. Thank you, sir. John, can you provide the benefit of uh, your educational background, licensing, and experience testifying for boards to this board? Uh, sure. Um, I'm president of Atlantic Traffic. Uh, we're located at 30 Independence Boulevard in Warren, New Jersey. Uh, I have been here since 93 uh, when I graduated from Lehigh University, civil engineering degree. I'm licensed in the state and about six others. And I've testified from this township and accepted as an expert and also in about 150 others in New Jersey. Okay. I'd like to ask that the board accept Mr. Harder as an expert in traffic. Please. So sort of what? Thank you. Great. So I, I think I'll just go through what I believe is pertinent for the application. Uh, we have... Uh, to start out with NJDOT is probably the most important aspect as we front uh, US Route 22. Um, I will refer to it as an east-west roadway. It's a, at a bit of um, kind of at a, at a, you know between north, north and south and east and west, but for sim simplicity purposes. Uh, DOT has granted us a letter of no interest for the project, and that was done on August 8 of 2020. And what that means is that the state is, has agreed that we would maintain the access as it is today within the state right-of-way. And they further agreed that the traffic associated with our project would not increase in, in, in a significant manner. So there, there's actually a dramatic reduction in traffic if you look back at what the Phillipsburg Mall generated. So the, the DOT process is to, even if a portion of a building is vacant, they, they will run trip generation calculations uh, for an existing use and compare it to the, in the proposed case. So 
um, looking at the, the trip generation uh, as a fairly major mall back in the day, the weekday evening peak hour, so we tend to look at peak hours for this exercise. So morning, weekday, evening, weekday, and then a Saturday. And the site calculations that DOT accepted, uh, were found, we found that the weekday evening peak hour would be reduced by over 800 trips in the uh, compared to the former Phillipsburg Mall, and on Saturday more than 1,500 peak hour trips. So given those numbers, the, there's a dramatic reduction in traffic. Uh, the only slight increase was found during the weekday morning. Um, shopping centers don't generally generate much uh, traffic on a weekday commuter period, and that was 24 weekday morning peak hour trips. So a very nominal amount of, of traffic. And you know, just in general, we, we wouldn't um, have much volume uh, compared to um, the, the former shopping centers you can see. Uh, the DOT uh, did review <clears throat> the on-site signal. So we've made some changes uh, to the design. Uh, Dan presented earlier uh, the site plan we, on the on-site intersection. It's interconnected with the Route 22 traffic signal. So we're going to continue to maintain that, but make improvements over the current design. Uh, the on-site traffic signal is actually under DOT's operation. They're going to turn that over to us as a private signal as of May. Uh, but they, are, they have been reviewing the on-site design. We're fully reconstructing the traffic signal and making improvements. Uh, at the last council meeting we went to, the mayor had raised concerns about the inbound traffic and trucks and how can we make it more, even more efficient than it, than it is. So just to, to talk about that, so the, I think just to establish the access, so there's a western access that's right in, right out, unsignalized, it's stop controlled. There's an eastern access that's right in, right out. That's actually a free flow right out because you turn into a new lane as you head east towards 519 intersection. The center intersection is a bit unusual because it's signalizing a double left turn in and a double left turn out. They're, they're not the traditional location. They don't crisscross. So they're able to operate at the same, under the same phase, the left in and the left out at the same time. What that does is it does complicate the on-site intersection that's signalized here, which is the outer loop road we're referring to. And that's essentially the existing loop road that we're upgrading. The change that we made with the feedback from the, at the council meeting is that the double left is made into the site and this segment, the inbound segment, we've widened to be three receiving lanes. So as you continue into the site and then you get to the loop road, you now would have a left only lane that would enable you to get to Starbucks and the other uses to the east. And then you would have two through lanes that will enable you enable traffic to drive straight into the inner loop road, which is the new loop road for all warehousing traffic. So that would serve not only our use, but in the future, if, if this development is made to the south, that would also serve the same traffic. So keeping segregation of trucks as much as we can. So the warehousing activities are all in the inner loop road. The only truck activity outside of that would be coals and the out parcels, and that's already activity for trucks that's occurring today. So the, the, the other great thing about the design is that we're fortunate. We had a, a major shopping center with 640 feet of two lanes of left turn storage, which is what, 1,280 feet in total. You can accommodate um, about 16 trucks at once. We would not see that at, at one time in, in, in a cycle, but there's plenty of, of capacity for the inbound movements. And the way the signal is phased today, and we'll continue to maintain this aspect of it, is when that double left turn gets a green arrow and it comes in, they would see a green um, signals as they enter at the loop road, and then we'll proceed. Instead of today, you have to make a left or a right at that loop road intersection. You can now go straight in with two through lanes. So we're really getting that traffic off of the road immediately. And the, I think some of the concern that we've, we've resolved to at the council meeting is that if there are trucks in either one of the left double left turn lane entering the site, they can still get into the warehousing 
uh, location without having to change lanes in that short segment. So we've really thought through, as you can see, Bowler has, especially with the, the internal loop road design, trying to segregate that, that activity from everything else. The, the internal <coughs> light, I think you said, is coordinated to time with when the trucks are able to make the left, they can continue to go straight. Those lights are on the same time. Or so That's right. So, right, right. so just like in New York City, you get on an avenue, you get a green, and it just continues green as you proceed. Same concept. Um, let's see. What else do I want to hit on? In terms of truck traffic, there was a question I just heard about. Essentially, it was suggesting that trucks making a right out. So the right in and right out location for trucks is shown in red is the easternmost access point. And the, the benefit we see of that is that trucks will stay to the perimeter of the site and then enter the warehousing area that we've described, the inner loop road, very quickly. And Bowler's eliminated some of the cross aisles near Coles, which helps just limit it, you know, again, conflicts between trucks and cars. The, the right out movement will have plenty of stacking. That's the other beauty of being along the perimeter of the site. And then as you turn out, you do enter into a new lane. So you're, you're not yielding. You, you actually can get out into the state right of way. I would not expect, we will, we have a, a wayfinding plan. So we design uh, signage that's on site along the Route 22 frontage and within the site that's going to be uh, much more um, um, adequate than what is there today. The signage is not follow state highway and federal highway standards. So we, we've we um, used a, a software called Guide Sign, and we're designing the signs similar to what you'd see on a state highway. So Route 22 with the shield symbol consistent with what you'd see out within the, the state right-of-way. And that signage package will direct the trucks throughout the site and entering the site to, to, to indicate which locations to use. So we, we It'll be a much better um, wayfinding sign package than, than what the mall had. Uh, so we feel that that will really you know, be the solution to some of the concerns that were, were raised earlier. Uh, another point just about the that last point on the traffic, just generation numbers. When we look at what's remaining, uh, the cold and the, the out parcels, the four to remain, they're, they're fairly high intensive uses because um, each of the four actually has a drive-through. So um, when we look at that trip generation I talked about earlier, that those components of the use that are there today and will, will remain in the future are going to make up more than 50% of the trips during a peak hour. So in the AM we found they were 55%, uh, evening about two-thirds of the traffic generation, and then on a Saturday 90% because the warehouse won't have much going on. And, so just just a point. So that I guess under um, the traffic standards, you would include the mall space in the traffic calculation. Correct. But even if you remove that and you just take what's actually happening happening on site now, most of the traffic that's generated on the site is already happening. Right? That's right. Right. Now we're going to see more truck traffic. Um, just to give you a sense. Uh, the use that the site today would generate, if we look at ITE calculations, about seven trucks in a peak hour, morning or evening, and then we would generate about 20 is the, is the projection. Now, that trucks tend to go off peak, so they would you know, try not to be there during the commuter hours, and that's, that's why we would see roughly about 20 in a peak hour. And that's coming and going, so... That's right. Yeah, so if it's not even 10 in, 10 out, or you know, some combination. Correct. That's right. Uh, another item that we there were some comments from colliers that you know we, we feel we can address all, all of the concerns that were raised. Another aspect of the signal design that's new for the outbound double left out, we are the DOT had asked um, for a force off detector. So that means that we would um, we, we're looking to, we don't want to have any backups within this out, outer loop road area that would block left turns in from 22. So that force off loop is, is intended, or it's not a loop anymore, it's more of a detector, like a radar detector. That will help ensure that we don't have the, this, this backup that would block 
any kind of kind of inbound traffic from Route 22. So something that's not there today that we would be adding and incorporating into the design. Uh, in terms of levels of service, uh, we, we did analyze that signal, group of signals and how they're coordinated and the latest uh, way that we're, we're recommending uh, that design and, and we're waiting on DOT's feedback on the design is we, we, we obtain levels of service D and better. So D is in David. So uh, traffic engineers, when we get to the levels of service E and F, that's when we really have concerns of, of, in terms of capacity issues. So that's demonstrating that we have a good you know, traffic flow. Remember again that the site was designed, as I mentioned on a Saturday, to accommodate like 1,500 <coughs> trips than it is today in a peak hour. So we're dealing with a lot less traffic, but obviously trucks, and we, we, we've accounted for that in the design. Uh, the last issue I, I did hear that, it, that came up that was um, mentioned through the questions of other witnesses about uh, how do we enforce on-site and even driveway movements. Uh, one thing that's been done in other applications I've been on is, is allowing Title 39, which means that any kind of regulatory signs that we have on site uh, where we, for example, like we, in our wayfinding at this eastern westernmost connection between the inner loop road and the out loop, outer loop road, we don't expect trucks there. Right? We have this slip lane, this right out, the angled access, that's where the trucks are anticipated to go. So we have a no truck sign there to egress between the inner loop road and the outer loop road. So under Title 39, if we were to grant that, it means on private property, the police could actually ticket such a, move, a violation. What are they going to do with that? So right, that, that would be um, something that we could do. There was concern about parking as well on the loop road. There really isn't the width to physically park. You would be blocking traffic. Mm -hmm. It's not as though there's a shoulder that you could sit on, like you often see trucks yeah. sitting on shoulders. I believe you make an agreement with the local township for the Title 39 to be enforced by local police. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And Chris, I think that covers my direct, so okay. I can answer questions. Um, I'll show you my map I draw. <laughs> all right. I don't, the little road that you just showed me on the map, all right, right next to your red ones or pink ones, whatever you are. The slip road. All right, the slip road. Yeah. Oh, right. Put your slip? Here. Which direction is that flow? So that is going from west. So and that's the only, it's, it only goes out. It does not come back in. That's correct. That's what I want to make, because that'll correct. screw up your traffic. Your right. Road. Again, that's really keeping things right. very simple here with trucks, in only, and, and, and Passenger cars associated right. with warehouse in only, and then this is right out, and that's all associated with the, the no, I agree left in, left out of the sure signal. Yeah. I got a question about your <clears throat> your um, eastbound right out. Are you going to have to do any kind of improvements there? That seems kind of narrow to me uh, to get a truck out of there. I understand you're coming out onto a separate new lane but are you going to have to widen that at all um we are not there's no proposal to dot has not asked us you know had a con had raised that concern we have been in touch with dot they're working on improvements to 519 just east of us uh and 22. so I, you know i know that's an area of concern for trucks. No, i mean widen you know the okay. ramp on your property oh within, that's very narrow within, within for, our site yeah. Oh, okay. Dan, I don't. No. 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 Geometric changes. You're gonna keep that the way it is. Uh, what about pedestrian crossings to the restaurants? There, are you gonna have, you know, is there sidewalks or anything? Crosswalks and. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Actually, if we, if we can call it Mr. Reeves again, he can speak yeah. on that. Yeah. So that was something that your planner required of us. And can we? Can we come back to Mr. Sure. Reeves just to keep the yep. uh, I'll keep the flow. keep the record clean? Have you completed your testimony? Yes, sir. Okay. I just had one final question for Mr. Hart. Um, in terms of the foresight detector you mentioned, uh, you initially indicated that that would be provided for the signals um, for traffic leaving the site. Is that also going to be applied, that system also going to be applied for traffic entering the site? 
Uh, it, it wouldn't, and the reason is that the concern with the state, if you can picture, the, the, the double left out, so the western signalized access, the concern is if it were to back up and back toward the inbound is the right. state's concern. Right. So they don't want this traffic to be in a queue that would block inbound and then back out onto the state highway. So the, I guess the question is, on the do, double turn into the site uh, off 22 westbound, is there any possibility that traffic would get, or trucks might get trapped? The signal goes red on the inner loop road, on the outer loop road, I guess, coming in, and trucks end up getting stacking out of the Route 22. That's not a concern. No, because that, that was where I started with my discussions of the operations. Right. This left in will be timed so that left it'll turn inbound. red before the green on the internal goes red. Correct. So it's time for it to clear. Correct. Okay. So we want to clear that out. We just don't want the, the <laughs> out, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but we don't want the out, we want to allow the outbound um, some more. The force off detector will give a little bit more time if we need it to clear things clear. out. So it's really this, this direction, this westbound uh, direction that we were concerned about adding to this. You don't want to block the in. Yes, because we don't want to block the in. And the beauty of it too is that we don't really have trucks queuing like this, right? Because except for the out parcels and colds, but our trucks again are going to be stacking coming out here to a double left on the outer loop road. So that's another, I think, great aspect of the design. That queuing is, you know, west of the, the, the on-site signal, so not potentially making, you know, blocking the, the area we're, we're concerned with. Right. Okay. I, I, and I'm going to use your own things. All right. If 133 people get out at the same time, okay, because your shift change, all right, um, are you, and it's an internal question, all right, are they stagger those shifts so that only, only 50 people get out at, at one time? You know what I mean? The place that work at, you know, one, one this department got out at two thirty. This department got out at three. This department got out here. I, I think that, started that's a great question. Through. I think the problem is it's very tenant specific. It is, yeah. but it, it what it does is it really, really, really impacted because I worked under both of those um, where everybody got out, and then when the shift changed, when everybody got out, it shut the town down. All right, the place I worked at because there was a thousand people let out. Almost, you know what I mean? Um, so it, it, it does impact that highway very much. And, and, and the people coming in to get their food at the same time you're letting the ship out. But, but you know I, think, I, mean? so, I think it goes back to what I was just saying there, the beauty of how we've designed it so that if, if we have traffic wanting to leave and go west toward Pennsylvania, they would be stacking in this direction, eastbound out of, out of the right, interior. Right, stacking cars and stacking trucks at the same time. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. And then, and then yeah. heading east, you're actually, they would be required to come down to the perimeter of the, the eastern perimeter and exit over here where we have plenty again plenty of stacking okay. as well so i think we've you know really addressed that, that no i don't know what else but that's not my thing there but you know I, I it is a concern that i could see creating a concern right if everyone that's out at one time yeah. <coughs> you know because it is a it's a lot of traffic that comes through there already you know you know everybody from from easton and you know and and, and fever they're all coming here you know, so it's, I understand it, but I just wanted to see you. Anything else from the board? No, I'll open it up to the public. I have one question that you brought up. In terms of traffic passing through from the warehouse loop to the, shall we say, the commercial loop without going out on 22, we have our wall and we have our berms. And the question I have is, has anybody looked at the site distance like on your slip ramp where you're coming down, will they be able to see cars that are sitting there? That, and, well, that was actually, I, I believe there was a Collier's comment about on-site site yeah, triangles and, and sight lines. That's important. You're yeah, right. and, that, and the other one I have is like looked at. when you try to clear everybody coming from 22 into the site, and they're going to pass Lefting. over what? Left in. <laughs> yes. And they're going to pass over the commercial road that serves the front and go into the warehouse. You also have behind the wall, you have 
basically the warehouse driveway crossing. And I guess to make sure you have enough sight lines that people don't barrel off of, to get through the intersection and then catch somebody coming across behind the wall. I guess all I'm saying is somebody ought to look to make sure you're comfortable with the sight distance on those intersections because we have an eight foot wall on top of burn. I, I couldn't agree with you more because I, I'm, I'm always looking at sight lines and see a lot of old designs that don't, you know, Yeah, no, I, I love the walls, but obviously yeah. you got to be safe. So. Right. Well, point. Good point. Thank you. Hello. Questions from the public? Yes. So, um, the trip calculation that you did, when was that done? What year was that done? So it's what I was talking about in terms of trip generation is actually yeah. calculations based on size of uses and their type of use. Oh, okay. So there are standards that DOT makes traffic engineers use when when you file for an application or request a letter of no interest like we did. Okay. So you were talking about numbers and you said when it was currently a mall. So what year were those numbers calculated? Well, it's it's so it's a it's a standard. So IT is the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and it's a it's an engineering society for transportation engineers and traffic engineers planners. DOT uses their data, counties, and they compile data from many years. So the shopping center category within the land use has over a thousand uh, data points. So what the DOT what ITE does is they take based on the size of each of those uses and the trips that were counted, they then graph those and create average rates and equations that enable us to forecast quite accurately what a similar you know, proposed use would generate. So that's what DOT requires us to use. We also have other land use categories like fast food with drive through or coffee shop with drive through that's used for those out parcels. So. So there's no current data because um, there's been no current well, usage? So we, we have counts at the access along 22 that were actual counts. And then we add, we have the existing counts from the, the existing uses, but for the warehouse, we have to project using ITE. So we did an analysis, but it, it, it's based on those components I just described. So other warehouses hire, well, other developers hire their own <coughs> traffic engineers to do a study. There was no current recent study done for trucks for this property, correct? It was a compilation of many years and that agency you talked about. Correct. It's a number of years old, the data that we have for the site, correct? It's a few years old. So it's a number of years old. And it was about the mall usage, not truck traffic. So there's a big difference between truck traffic and car traffic, correct? Well, we're able with ITE to forecast, project the trucks as well. So we can project total amounts of vehicles. That's what I, those early right. numbers I used. And then I talked about truck traffic during the peak hour. So today, the current uses that would, would remain uh, about seven trucks in the peak hour. The out parcels would generate, coals would generate, and then the warehouse that would be about 20 in a peak hour. So about three times as much during a peak hour. Okay. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around comparing truck and car traffic. I just think that's kind right. of so ludicrous. Right, so the analysis, but the way the trucks are accounted for, so when we look at the signal timing, the lane configuration, mm -hmm. and we run a model, we, we have to account for the percentage of trucks. And that, mm -hmm. so that's factored in. So a truck, you know, is slower than a passenger car, but that's that's how it's accounted for in the model. And it takes up more space, a truck. Right, right. Right. So we looked at the queuing, and that's what I talked about earlier. We were benefiting from that really long double left turn lane, and it, it's there today, and that will work very well for, for our use. And I hope to God it's never 15 trucks, because that wouldn't leave any cars to be able to go in there. Right. Right. I was just <laughs> establishing how much capacity there is, but we don't expect that. So you said 20 per peak hours. What do you project off peak hours? 
It would, it would. It could be more than that. So trucks tend to avoid commuter hours because they, they prefer to be on the road when there's, you know, less congestion. So more. More than. More yes, off peak. It, it, right. It could be more than 20 during certain times of the day. So was there an overall number per day of trucks that would be going through this facility? Uh, it would be. We we can forecast that with ITE. So. Um, that would be on the order of 600 trips, so roughly 300 in in a day and 300 out in a day. But to put it in perspective, the overall site's expected to generate 18,000 trips in a day, so it's only 3% of what the site would generate. The former uh, Phillipsburg Mall would generate about 31,000 in a day based on cars. Correct. Car and some trucks. Cars. Big difference. Um, so 600 trips per day of trucks in and out of this facility, spilling onto 22, with already Bridgepoint trucks and then Strikers trucks and all the other warehouses that are built. Wow. 22 is two lanes. Right. So and thousands yet, of fewer passenger cars. NJDOT. Um, their major access permit unit is currently doing a technical review of this application. Was that completed? Well, they, it's a little bit unusual because they, they granted the letter of no interest. So that means that they've accepted that we, we can maintain the access and that, that the traffic levels are, are, are acceptable. The uniqueness is that the state has jurisdiction of this, not only the 22 signal, but the interconnected on-site signal. So they were in the process, they've reviewed that twice. We've, we've made revisions, but brand new signals, so they're, it's very subjective how it's designed. And then the state, under the second review, said, here are some comments, please address them, but we've decided to rescind maintenance of, of a signal on private property. We're gonna ask you, as the developer, to, make, to maintain and operate that signal. So that's why there's a technical review. It's very unusual when you have a letter of no interest. There usually isn't a review like that, but that's that's why there is. So that means it's complete. That technical review. No, that's oh. still ongoing. But that's still ongoing. We had very few comments the last time we submitted, so I I, I don't expect that will be much more work. Okay. Um, so you talked about stacking on the property. And on that, that like long, I started to talk about this before exit, and I had it right. Yeah. So those trucks stacking, possibly meaning trucks, you know, lined up to exit, right? That's a neighborhood right there, right? Yes, we were just there on Monday night. Right. So there's no fence or anything there or buffer. That was or addressed burn. at that hearing and they, there will be. Okay. Because I mean, those yeah, people no, live there forever. Have. So. <laughs> That is, that's going to be addressed. So now let's talk about what I started to, to say before. I'm very visual. So you're, you're pulling out. A truck you were, pulling you were, out. You, maybe I can describe it more quickly. Sure, a right ahead. out at the eastern driveway, and you said somehow the truck would have to U-turn to go west. Well, hopefully they're going to use the other exit to right. go west. They, they don't have good, there's not very good wayfinding signage today, and that's what we'll be providing. Right. So it'll be clear yes. that the truck would need to use the signalized access to go west. I'm just going to illustrate what's going to happen, okay? Because it happens now. So they're going to come out of there. Yes, they have their own lane. It's a narrow lane. You don't have to yield. That light's coming up. And if you want to get over, you have to get over, okay? There's not much distance there, especially for a truck. And there's all cars because there's a gas station there that has a lot of usage. There's people coming on and off. So now that truck didn't use that exit, so now it wants to go west. It's going to cross over all well, the lanes. Why does it want to go west if we have very good wayfinding signage? Because they don't follow the rules. I don't know how many times we can say that to you. They don't. We live here. We feel it. We see it. We're experiencing it. I'm telling you what's going to happen. So the crop. So they're crossing over, now blocking all lanes of traffic to get over into the turning lane. Then they're going to go into the mess of that middle area. Which right, DOT is feet. in the process of redesigning and, and eliminating. Before they build your warehouse or after? They have told me that it's going out to bid later this year. 
So, but I, you know, I can't speak for when it'll be constructed. I won't. I won't. Maybe I'll be dead by that time. So, but it's not something we control. I know. I, I know you don't control that. So they're now blocking all the lanes in the middle. I promise you this because they don't fit. They can't turn and wait there. So you're now all cars between, are also trying to turn. Just to be clear, you're talking the median between east yes, and west. Yes, yes, that, that median. That's, median. That's what, I didn't know it was a median when right. it's a road. I thought it was a median. Right, when it that's was. what the traffic engineer for the state told me. Right. Yeah. What a hot mess. So now this, so here would be my perfect scenario because I know you want to build this warehouse. Um, wait, get that damn intersection fixed and stop the carnage that's about to happen because that is a tragedy. So when you have trucks parked blocking the <laughs> lanes, cars are now in those lanes that are zipping by because the light turned green. It is such a horrible hazard. Your warehouse is going to create more of a hazard. Allowing this to go through is going to cause carnage. Now offering testimony. No, I gave a question. I said, what are they going to do about that? Can they hold? Can they hold? Oh, God. Listen, I'm not a professional. I'm a teacher. So are you going to hold off from building it to protect our citizens? I didn't think so. Sorry. Not sorry. Robert Bruce, uh, Levin Harwich Road. Uh, I'm a tractor trailer and I'm getting off of 78 at exit 3. And I want to enter your warehouse. And I'm going to do that through the center double lane, uh, left turn lane. There's two lanes on 78. I'm going to get to there. If I want to get to the front of the warehouse or the back of the warehouse, one side of which is supposed to be for a bobtail, just a cab, and the other side is supposed to be for a loaded tractor trailer, I will be able to proceed straight yes. across what used to be a blockage. If I need to get to the back, I have to make a right. You could either go right or left. I could go right or left. Right. Using the internet. Okay, so from those two lanes, I'm a tractor trailer. I get, I make that full left turn. At that section of roadway where 22 is done and I'm waiting to get to the next light, is that three lanes now? Yes, that's what I described. Okay, so how do I, if I'm in the left lane, how do I get to make a right? If you're in the left, you left lane on 22, you wouldn't need to be. The only truck that would really need to be in that lane is if they're going to Taco Bell. And they've been there for years, so that delivery. I don't want to go to Taco Bell. I want to go into the front of the back of the warehouse. So I'm going to go. So I'm going to go straight through in either yeah. case. So the lane configuration when you come in. We'll have a, a left turn lane that'll open up that'll be exclusive left, so it'll serve the three restaurants to for cars, no or, trucks, or it could be a truck delivering there. Okay. So that that would be a common. That's what happens mm -hmm. today. And then the other two that the double left also has would be directed into. So the left the left kind of opens up off these three lanes. Right. So if you're you would need to be in the leftmost left lane to turn into that. To, in, you know, to get to the Starbucks. Well, your, your ideal scenario with opening up access straight into the inner roadway is to actually allow them to go into the inner roadway before they make a left or a right? Yes. Okay. And I didn't really finish. So essentially the two left turn lanes are being on 22 are being directed into two through lanes, one being a through only and one being a through right. So that the, we did listen to feedback from the mayor had concerns with the two receiving lanes that we had before, and this solves that that issue. Okay. So. All right. My, I'm going to see it when I see it, and I'm going to have my complaints about it when I when I when I see it. And the only thing I'd like to add in that respect, um, before I get to my last point, last question, is um, in a Lincoln Tunnel, you're not supposed to change lanes. 
I will drive through it tonight. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, you haven't before? Enjoy it. It's wonderful. I do it every day. Okay. Very good. Most every day. So they have the, the pylons, the in-road pylons. Doesn't Plastic prevent. Pylons, yeah. Okay. They don't protect. They don't prevent anybody from from hitting them. It's no big deal. Is there a uh, a belief that if there's a problem with this design, that maybe on that section, once you cross that 22, once you make that double left lane and get across 22, that you put something there, if, if it turns out that you guys are wrong and, and they're not just going straight into the inner roadway, but they're like taking a right-hand lane and doing what they did to my friend the other day and cutting her off to make a left from the right-hand lane? Because if you're in the right-hand lane, there's nothing to prevent an EV tractor trailer driver from making a left and cutting them off just like before. I mean, that seems to me like a solution in the future that should be considered. Are we agree? Okay, very good. Very good, because the, prob the problem will be with the accidents. The only other question I had, with the traffic lights in a private light, it, it, are they... Uh, uh, seating control of just the interior Correct. light, Correct. so they're still controlling the 22 light, but they're seating control to you. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no response, we'll close the public portion. Thank you. I have uh, one more witness, our planner, Matthew Flynn, who has promised to be extremely quick. Oh. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, we could swear him in. Oh, there's another question. Uh, yes. Are you going to allow us, if it goes past 10 o'clock, to ask, ask questions of this witness? No. So how can you let him be a witness and testify without allowing the audience? We don't continue at next meeting. Okay. So he'll have to come back. If you have okay. questions to ask him. We have questions to ask, and we haven't finished them tonight. We can come back at the next meeting. Council, you got five minutes, and I. Yeah. So if if we're doing a hard stop at ten, then it makes more sense to put this witness on at the next meeting. Yeah. I think. Okay. So we'll we'll do that, and we'll we'll come back at the next meeting, and I assume we can do that without further notice that we're carried. Yes. To the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Just make a motion to carry. And what uh, the date of that? I'm going to take a motion to carry the uh, uh, motion. Okay. Yeah. Motion. Okay. Is that May 24th? Second. 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 Sorry. Members, Hartman? Here. Lito? Yes. Weeks? Yes. Vice Chairman Sampson? Yes. Harrigan? Yes. Okay, so for the benefit of the public, this matter has been carried to May 24th, which is a Wednesday, 7 p.m. in these chambers. There will be no further notice. So this is your notice of that upcoming meeting. You're not going to receive another publication or certified mail. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Well, we have five minutes of public comment. Public comment? Public comment. I thought it was going to happen. Got it. I didn't start yet, though. <laughs> Ready? Okay. So this entire process of uh, the redevelopment plan to this moment tonight, in my opinion, has been clouded with deception. There's been secret subcommittee discussions without public meetings or minutes, behind the scenes planning, last minute public notices, the lack of published minutes in timely manner, and a council's refusal, council and board's refusal to openly and honestly answer public questions, just to name a few. This board is only the vehicle the town council has used to implement its plans 
for the continued decimation of our town and the surrounding era, area. There is no massive tax windfall, windfall coming. There's no increase in sustainable jobs for people in the immediate area and no real benefit aside from the cash in the pockets of the developers and those who uh, benefit from these plans from the start. Shame on all of you for allowing this to continue to happen to our town. For months, many of us have stood before you and, and, and have spoken repeatedly against the overdevelopment of the warehouses and the repercussions this development has brought to our community. Unfortunately, it seems the puppet strings have been pulled tight and the citizens' pleas have been ignored, downright dismissed without any consideration. It's up to all of you to put the citizens of Lopacon at the forefront and protect the valuable resources in our community and the people that live here. It's too bad that you all seem to have other plans and, and have decided not to do right by the citizens of Lopacon, and you continue, continue to put us all in danger. So now, what is your plan? It seems Lopacon began making their plans years ago with this absurd vision of asphalt and warehouses. Unfortunately, without the ability to attract clean businesses or engage the citizens to help develop the plans, you have left Lopacon vulnerable. This board and the council lack the ability to make smart plans and have failed to safeguard this community and to put further safe, safeguards in place to protect this town and the residents from what is the prolification of warehouses. What is your plan now? What's the plan for stopping illegal parking of trucks throughout this town? All the truck parking lots that have popped up, Bellevue being the most recent. What is your plan for enforcement of road safety violations and increased traffic? What is your plan to deal with the increase in, in uh, pollution and garbage? What is your plan for fire and rescue? Should there be a disaster like the fire in Pennsylvania or God forbid a chemical leak? What is your plan for how to keep trucks off our neighborhood roads? Instead, you're playing catch up, actually having the gall to invite NJ, NJDOT to help with traffic and roads when you are the ones who continue to allow for more warehouses and the increased truck traffic. Our council president even stated, the council has taken strong steps to curb overdevelopment and all but eliminates the influx of warehouses. Was he joking? What has this council, the planning board done to eliminate the influx of warehouses? They've done nothing but roll out the red carpet for these greedy developers. In fact, it was their idea to add two more warehouses to the redevelopment plan and refuse any of the NJ guidance published last year to help curb warehouse development. <laughs> How is this taking strong steps to curb overdevelopment of warehouses? We have six in Lopatcom. How is that eliminating the influx of warehouses? This is just comical. Shame on the developers, too, for making such land grabs and developing warehouses in lower socioeconomic areas, really. How would they feel if a warehouse popped up in their backyard and disrupted their way, a peaceful way of living? Shame on them. How do they sleep at night? Well, I imagine they sleep well as they laugh all the way to the bank. The carnage is going to be on all of your hands, and it's only a matter of time before uh, a disaster strikes. The grossly, grossly inaccurate traffic studies have opened this area up to an unfortunate tragedy. Traffic studies are misleading and unreliable. We all live here and drive these roads and know that our roads and intersections cannot handle additional truck traffic. And you allowing for the building of yet another warehouse is downright negligent. I encounter unsafe road conditions daily in this area. Their stories and photos are endless. Building more warehouses and bringing additional traffic onto our roads is unsafe and hazardous. There are significant safety concerns that you should be concerned about. I am not sure what is going to take for this town and the council for you guys to open your eyes and protect Lopacon. Yeah. I don't know why. What? I can time it. It'll be 
Donna Schneider, 26 Meta View. I just, I know what this board is here to do. I know what your roles are, but your roles are also to keep us safe. And if that entails you hiring our own professionals, because maybe you have some questions about the traffic studies that always come back as perfect from the uh, developers, it would really show the residents here that you care about us if you would hire your own experts, or at least put that out to the council to hire some experts, because these, these uh, things are basically a bunch of crap, really. <laughs> so thank you very much. Anyone else? Well, Bruce, 11 Hall, which road? I'll make it quick. Um, it was my understanding, I believe it was council, I may have been his board, um, that uh, there were new policy standards that was set out by the State Planning Commission last year, detailed guidelines, and um, it was unknown by the board council. I don't know if the board knew about them. They were additionally buttressed just this week by the uh, Highlands Commission, and um, part of what the Highlands Commission was talking about would have literally prevented the warehouse on Strikers Road from being built. It would be against them and they would be able to turn whatever screws they had against this township. And I find it disheartening and disgusting that you guys, collectively council and planning board, weren't on top of that to protect our citizens from the disaster that Striker has become. And, you know, I understand the redevelopment of the mall is a dead Ball and you're going to do something about it, but it ain't that. It's well, everything else. I understand this whole land. It was dead. It was polluted. It got cleaned up and it got built. But what you're allowed to happen on Strikers Road, you guys could have been on top of it. The Highlands Council was there with money to help you figure out your zoning laws. And you can point a finger at a zoning board of adjustment and they should have did it. But damn it, we're all living under the same master plan. And it, it screwed us. Anyone else? Seeing none, hearing none, I entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. 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 All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Anyone against? Yes. Signify by saying no. Any abstention? We've covered it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.